The way we're going to finish this work is not going to be by our might. It's not going to be by our strength, but it's going to be by the Spirit of God, His power. It says we're seeking for grace and power to be given to His people now. We do not believe that the time has fully come when He would have our liberties what? Now, when the prophet wrote that, she's not saying that she didn't believe the events are about to take place. What she said is, basically, if you read it before it, we're not ready for it. So we don't believe God's going to let it happen yet because in his mercy, he doesn't want us to be lost. It says, uh, the prophet saw how many? Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth doing what? Holding. Now, we're going to study that uh, today. But it says, holding the four winds of the earth that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on what? Now, we know if you study the Bible that winds represent strife. It represents trouble. It represents war, revolutions, problems of all kinds. It's saying that this is getting ready to blow upon the earth. But, but before it does, the prophet says, another angel was seen ascending from the east. He cried to those four angels saying what? Hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees till we have sealed. Till we have what? Sealed. The servants of our God, where? Now, do you get the picture of the two angels? When I say two angels, I mean two sets of angels. One is the four that are staying on the earth, uh, four corners of the earth. What are they doing? Holding, holding, holding what? The winds. What does that wind represent? Strife, war, revolution, tribulation, trouble. So holding back trouble so it doesn't blow up on the earth. So what would happen if the angels let go of the wind? A time of trouble such as never was. But now another uh, angel comes from the east. And he says to those four angels, what does he say to them? What does that tell us the four angels are getting ready to do? They were actually getting ready to let it go. Trouble was getting ready to come. And then the other angel says, hold. Uh, we'll read it. But this, and then it says, has sealed the servants, until we have sealed the servants of our God in their what? So he says, hold the trouble until the sealing. Now watch what this says. This points out the work which we have now to do. Now, you understand that? Uh, so what, what points out the work in which we have now to do? What, what is it that points out the work? What points out the work in which we have now to do? If you understand, let me see if you understand that. What points out the work? The ceiling, yes, but it's another part. Uh, the, the work is for the ceiling, but he said, do something. He says, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees till we have sealed. So what was the angel who was going to do the ceiling? What was he saying first? He was saying, wait, angels, four angels, don't let the trouble come until we can accomplish the work of what? The seal. So it says, this points out the work which we. So that angel who does the sealing is showing us what we should be doing right now. So what should we be doing? Twofold. Number one, what should we be doing? We should be praying. We should be praying first, what? Don't let the crisis come yet. We're not ready. Don't let it happen right now. See, if, if, if the sealing were to take place and, and be finished, if the crisis were to come, do you know that most people would not yet be in a position to get sealed? And so if God were to allow the Sunday law to be passed, the time of trouble to begin, do you know that over, not just 99, but we almost 100% would be totally unfit. And so we should be doing first a prayer of, Lord, please don't let the crisis come yet. Lord, we're in 2021. Lord, please, I, that we don't, don't let it happen. We should be praying that first. But not so that we can watch television. Not so we can have some more time for vacationing. Not so we can kick the breeze and shoot the breeze. You know why we should be praying for God to hold up time? Until what? Number one, my own self and get ready for the sin. Number two, my family and get ready for the sin. Number three, we can work with other churches and other communities and worldlings who have never heard anything of this message. And get them ready for the ceiling. Do you know that this is the most important work at this time? This points out the work which we have now to do. Watch what it says. A vast responsibility is devolving upon men and women of prayer throughout what? To do what? To petition that God will sweep back the cloud of evil. And give a... This is what we should be praying for right now. Give a few more years of grace in which to do nothing. Is that what it says? And wish to work for the master. Let us cry to God that the angels may hold the four winds until missionaries shall be sent to all parts of the world and shall proclaim the warning against disobeying the law of 
this is the same. What, what my wife was talking about, that, 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 that group called uh, Farm Stew. I mean, it's a powerful uh, ministry that's going forward right now and it's going through many of the impoverished world. It goes everywhere, but especially to those in the impoverished world showing how to live. We should be praying for this type of work in every nation, every country. And while we're praying, we're praying for what? A few more years. Now, you know why we should be praying? I'm going to tell you something. Uh, you want me to be extremely honest with you. I believe in the natural course, we would never make it to 2025. Did you hear what I tell you? We would never make it to 2025. I believe that in the natural course, we would see a son in law prior to 2025. Unless we pray for a few more years. I'm talking about the natural order of things. Now, that's a, that's, a, that's a startling statement. Good morning, happy Sabbath. That is a startling statement. Come, come right on in. That is a startling statement, my friends, but, but it is the reality. I believe, I'm going to say it again. I'm going to say it again. I believe that if God did not step in and do something miraculous, we would not make it to 2025 before we see a Sunday law. I believe that with all my heart. Now, my brothers and my sisters, but if that were the case, I don't believe that we would be ready. Because there's a physical preparation and there is a spiritual. I don't think we're ready for either of them. Either of them. It's going to take a, it's going to take a great work that has to happen. He says we should be praying for a few more years of grace in which to work for the man. We should be praying, God, give us a few more years because naturally we would be in trouble. I'm telling you something. Look at our families. Look at our churches. Brothers and sisters, we haven't even gotten to the mega apostasy. We are in so deep apostasy right now. There is not an institution among us that is not being gripped by the devil himself. We don't have a, a place. And we have to get and start studying and start understanding we are in trouble. And, and, and where is the help going to come from? The Catholic Church going to help us? The Baptist can't help us. The Pentecostal can't help us. And I'm sorry, sad. But over 99% of our ministers or members can help us out of where we are right now. We are in trouble. And then I look at ourselves. I look at my own heart and I say, dear God, how can you depend on me? How can you depend on my family? Look at us. I don't know about you and your family. But we in this little church, you know, I believe, I believe, I'm, listen to me. Let me tell you something, Elder Smokey. I believe that God has selected this church to be a place in which people are going to come from all around the world to understand God's message. I believe that. I believe that very soon we're going to see this church become a, 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 a bastion, a little capital in which other seven Adventist churches will come to understand. That they will begin to look and start asking, what, what, are, what are you doing? What, what, what can we learn? I believe the community themselves, we're going to, by God's grace, put a program together here in which the community itself can be impacted. Do you think we need to do this? Yes. Do we need to follow God's blueprint? Can we make up a blueprint? Do we need to go back to the Bible and find out what God's plan is? Because God's plan is it will fill the, uh, the, the, the church, as God said, and it's going to fill the world with the message. Now. But before that can happen, something has to happen to us. And I'm praying. I, I, I recommit myself to God. I recommit myself to God. I, even this morning, today, I recommit myself to God. Lord, we cannot remain on the same level we're on. We have to rise higher in our spirituality. It has to go deeper. We found out that thinking men, it says, why the fall of the American empire will come by what? Right. Now, you remember something. Now, watch what this says now. This says, the historian writes that all negative trends that are plaguing America now are likely to get much worse, growing rapidly by what? Now, we don't have to wonder if that was a, 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 a misunderstanding on his part. Was he right or wrong? He wrote this in 2017. We've been preaching about this before 2017. But he's right. Growing rapidly by 2020 and will reach a critical mass no later than what? The American century proclaimed so triumphantly at the start of the World War II, 1939, moving to 1946, may already be tattered and fading by what? Now, this man said 2025, I wouldn't even give us 2024 if somebody doesn't start praying. I'm praying, Lord, please, please give us a little more time. I don't even know if we'll make it to 2024 unless God does something. You don't understand where we are in 2021. I told you, in one week, in one week of 2021, 
Everything that 2020 brought was passed in one week, the first seven days of 2021. We're at the brink of the civil war, at the brink of the division, at the brink of the condition that will bring on the Sunday law, but we're not ready. And God is trying to tell us, please, there is a work of preparation. There is a, this is a solemn time to be living in right now. He said that by 2025, it may all be tattered and fading except for the finger pointing. It can all be over by what? 2030. Now his trajectory from a natural standpoint, though maybe a few months late or a few uh, years late, he's right on step of his understanding of American collapse, American history. Um, what that means for the world picture. Because see, if America goes, guess who else goes? <laughs> if America goes, the entire world goes. And America is going right now, right as I speak. It's going on every field. Do you see what's going on in Texas? Yeah. Do you understand the failure of the grid, the power grid in Texas is a picture of the, the power grid across the entire country. That, that piece, people are dying. Dying. Of, look, it's so cold and the people don't know how to deal with it. They get into their cars. The carbon monoxide kill them. They have no idea. You can't do that. That shows us that people have no idea how to live. We're not ready for a crisis. I'm not even talking about spiritual. We're not ready for a crisis physically. But then when you come to spiritual, we have even a less chance unless we get the time, take the time to get our children ready. Our children. As young people, adults, families, we got to get ready. And with a precious child, we've got to get them ready. There is a work for all of us. And by God's grace, if we can learn it, can we teach somebody else? How can we teach it? If we, how can we teach someone else if we don't know ourselves? God's great goal right now is to teach us, not selfishly, but if we can learn, Amen. then we can teach somebody else. Amen. This is what God's plan is. We're studying this morning a chapter, uh, or rather a section that's called the ceiling. Let me see if I didn't put it up there. Or did I? I did. I did. We're studying something called the ceiling, the shaking, and the latter rain. What are we studying? The ceiling, the shaking, and the latter rain. Now, last time we were together, we studied the shaking. I'm not going to spend too much time there. We'll probably do a little review, but that, that's not where I'm really going this morning. We want to understand that between these three are a relationship. There's a relationship. There's a what? Relationship between the ceiling, the shaking, and the latter rain. These are not indiscriminate terms or words. There is a direct correlation and relationship between the ceiling, the shaking, and the latter rain. Very good. Now, we want to find that out. So before it's over with today, you should be able to tell me what the relationship is between the ceiling, the shaking, and the latter rain. That's our goal. And we want to understand how to survive all of them. And you're going to find out that the rain is significant to all of these things happening in their proper sphere. Now, in order to do that, in order to get ready, either physically or spiritually, we found out that there's a three-step process. There's a what? Step one. Step one. Somebody tell me. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Who said that? Sister Debbie. Sister Debbie. Praise God. Step one. Wake up. Do you know that physically? Let's just natural, physical world. Here's a man. He hasn't woken up yet, but he's putting on his clothes. He's eating his breakfast and he's getting his home ready. What is that man doing? He's dreaming. He's dreaming. How much is really taking place? Have you ever been in a dream and the food was prepared, the table was set, and you get into I bite? Now, I don't know about you. I always wake up <laughs> right when I get ready to put it in my mouth. <laughs> and you wake up at that same time, too, <laughs> and you bite into nothing. Now, do you know that a man who physically and spiritually is trying to get ready before he wakes up, he's doing nothing? He may dream, but imagine a man putting a hundred applications, Brother Tim, hundreds of applications, but he's sleeping. How many jobs are you going to get? None. Only the job in his dream, <laughs> but not, a re not in reality. Now, so the first step to all of it, physical or spiritual, in a literal sense, the very first step before you can do anything in the morning. Someone says prayer. You know, you can't even pray without waking up. Before you can do anything, you know, the first step is. You know, the Bible says that Jesus 
The first thing he did was rise up a great while before a day. Before he prayed, he woke up. <laughs> and after he rose, then he started praying. The very first thing that has to happen to us before a physical or spiritual preparation is that we must wake up. And this church, you know where my real burden for almost two years has been? You know, sometimes it seemed like I'm teaching, but I wasn't really trying to teach uh, uh, what the real message was. My real goal, and I just put, pulled the blinds off, my real goal for those first year and a half was really just to wake us up. Just to try to get us to understand we should be studying. We should be understanding. We haven't actually really got deep into the, in what needs to happen. But this is enough. I believe that right now, I know what I believe is happening. I believe that we're beginning to sense we've got to wake up yeah, yeah. in the church. Yeah. And just with that, just with this, with this room, it doesn't even take more. Somebody, well, I wish we needed a lot of people. Do you know that we have, a, oh, what's in this room? No, nothing more. Just what's in this room, we have enough to reach all of Virginia. The entire state. We could reach the nation. Just, just with this, this little, I'm not, you see, the numbers doesn't make a difference if you understand the rain, the message. So what God is trying to get us to do is to sense first what our real need is. Our real need is not simply, I want to knock on a door, I want to do this. Ah, the first step is, are we awake? Knocking on a door, meeting the community, trying to meet some needs, and you're not awake, we're wasting time. First step is what? Wake up. Wake up. And then you, you know this little formula when you reach somebody else, you know what the first step is. First step is wake up. And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to what? Awake out of sleep. Now, step two. After wake up, what's the second step? Talk to me. Clean up. Now, I'm going to tell you before I get there, I, I, I pull the screen off. This is why normally I get in trouble is because by God's grace, I can't lie. I got to tell you straight. Is that all right? And, and uh, the second step right now, my, my goal right now, my mind, what I'm thinking, I'm telling you, for the next studies, my mind is thinking. The year of 2021, the year of 20, 2020, 2020, 2021 is the year of cleanup. That's 2021. We got to clean up. We got to clean up our heart. We got to clean up our home. We got to clean up this church. And we're going to find out something to clean up the church. I, I thought Brother Smokey does a good job. You know, <laughs> Everything's clean. It is. But I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot more cleanup in the church that has to be done than simply taking trash out and making the windows look nice or the, 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 the uh, fans move smooth. Do we need those things? Yes, we do. But my brother and sister, there's a work of cleaning up that we have not yet fully in the beginning yet. We got to talk about it. It's serious business. And it's not just you. When I say clean up, you know what I'm really thinking about? I'm looking saying, Lord, I got to clean up, Lord. My family. Set thine house in. Order. You know what we have to be thinking about right now? Am I clean? Brother Tim, clean. Can you imagine that? Brother Bill, clean. This is what we're thinking about. Clean, Sister Debbie, Sister Shirley. Clean. I want to be clean. Now, can we clean ourselves up, yes or no? no. Impossible. We need Jesus to clean us up. But once we wake up, now we know the time, we know what to do. What, is, what do we need to do? This is what the cleansing of the sanctuary is all about on the Day of Atonement. Once that cleaning up process happens, what is the last and final step? Stand up. Do you know that you can't stand up until you first clean up? The Bible says, who shall stand when he appeareth? He's like a fuller soap. Who shall stand? He that have clean hands. The one that's going to stand is the one who has learned to clean up. If there's still something in our lives, we can't stand. And that's the position we have to be in when Michael stands up. That's the position we must be in when the judgment passion from the dead to the living. This is the work that we're trying to do so that the, the plan of redemption come to an end and Jesus can win the game. This is the process. But brothers and sisters, what we need to be saying is, Lord, first wake me up because right now it's time to do what? Clean up. Clean up. There's a relationship between the ceiling the shaking and the latter rain. So before we go deeper into that, would you reverently kneel with me as we go deeper into our study on this? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we're living in a great crisis. And Father, it's getting ready to get much worse. The 2020 began something, Lord, that won't get better. It's going to get worse and worse until the sun and Lord's pass and the time of trouble deepens. And the only thing that will take us out of this trouble is the second coming of Jesus Christ. 
And Father, you are telling us to pray that you hold off the crisis in this heart, the, the full breaking of this crisis, until you can get a people ready, a body ready, that you can pour your latter rain upon. Father, please hold back up the crisis. I'm pleading that you would help us as a church to begin to pray this more earnestly. We are not ready. Our families are not ready. The world is not ready. Please, dear God, it's happening so quickly. Hold back just a little longer, Father. Spare thy people. That was what we were getting ready to read in Joel 2. We're not going to read it now, but Lord, you told us in Joel 2 to, that the minister should be weeping between the porch and the altar praying, spare, spare, hold, hold. And later on, it tells us what they're holding for until the early and the latter rain. Please, dear Lord, help us to sense our need, our danger. Lord, I can't do anything. I need your Holy Spirit. Words that can arouse us, words that can instruct us, words that can encourage us of what needs to be cleaned out of our heart and home so that we can be in a position where we can receive your seal. We can receive the latter rain. We can be a part of the team that gives the loud cry and finishes this work on time that you can win this game of life. Please, dear God, we want to help. Abide with us now as we study. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 I want you to take your Bibles and turn to the last book of the Bible. We're going to the last book of the Bible. What book is that? The book of what? Yeah. Revelation. Go to Revelation chapter 7. We begin talking about this book and this, the scenes in this book, but we want to actually read it. In Revelation chapter 7, it introduces what we call the ceiling. And I want us to understand it simply. I want us to understand it intelligently. I want us to understand it scripturally. Uh, the ceiling, what it's all about. Now, in order to understand the setting of the seal, you have to understand what God is really asking about. He says, who shall be able to stand? He then begins to show why that there needs to be this condition of standing, because he says that winds are getting ready to blow on the earth. We found out that that winds were a symbol of crisis or trouble. Now, my brothers and sisters, are we living in the time of a developing storm? Yes or no? Yes. We are. We are living in the time of the developing crisis. And it doesn't matter where we look. On every country or continent of this planet we call Earth, crisis is developing. There is not a place that you can point to. There is not a location that you can tell me in which some crisis is not developing. If you were to point to Europe, you know what I would tell you? Crisis, crisis is developing right there. If you were to say, well, what about in China or in India or in Asia or in Africa? You know what I would tell you right now? Crisis. You say, well, that's over there in the east. What about the Middle East? You know what I would tell you? Crisis. Well, get away from the east. What about in the west? In the western hemisphere, surely this land of gold, the, the, what is it, the home of the free, the, the, the land of the free, the home of the brave? My brothers and my sisters here, this has to be a place that everything's all right. But I just tell you, you can point anywhere in America. You know what I would tell you? Crisis. Whether you go to North America, South America, Central America, Latin America, islands of the sea, you can't go anywhere without there being some crisis. But now listen, someone says, well, what about in America? You point the farthest west in America you can go. Where, where would you go? California. Is there a crisis in California right now? Yes. yes. I mean, the, the, one of the main governors is almost getting ready to be kicked out. They, they, they recall millions of signed petitions saying we're in so much trouble. That man won by a land, landslide before 2020. But not now. You say, well, let's go a little bit further Midwest, Texas. <laughs> well, you know what's happening there. Yeah. Crisis. Yeah. And while many of the, the, the governors and the senators all pointing the finger at each other, it was his fault, his fault. One senator who was supposed to be standing up in the midst while people are dying got on a plane and went to Cancun. Yeah. Oh, no. I wonder how many Texans can get on a plane and go to Cancun. See, what it's showing us is a lack of empathy and sympathy to mingle and sympathize, which is the spring of effective ministry. See, if you can't mingle and be able to understand what someone's going through, you can't minister to them. You see, God is trying to give us an understanding of the crisis and the trouble in all parts of the world, not just so we can hear about trouble. He wants us to understand the trouble that the world is in so that we can feel with each other. We can sympathize with one another and then we can begin to start ministering. You know, we need to understand what's happening right here in this little place called Richlands, in Lebanon, in Virginia, 
in America, in the world. Now, my brothers and sisters, some people right now think that the only reason why we don't have trouble was because we had a Republican president for four years. Well, that person has to be out of their mind. Someone says, well, the reason why we're out of trouble is because now we have a Democratic president. Well, that person, too, is, guess what, out of his mind. Someone says, well, I know what it was. It was Homeland Security. That gave you some security, didn't it? Foolishness. Someone says, well, I know what it is. It, it has to be the police. Th their slogan is protect and serve. Surely that's what's protecting us. Well, a few months ago, we found out that that's what people thought was killing us. Am I right? It depends on who you are, who is the police protects and serve. And this is just a matter of fact. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this is why you've got to be able to understand where is our protection? Someone says, well, I know what the protection is. The military. The Navy. The Marines. The Army. The military. Is that what our protection is? No. I want us to know this morning where our protection is and where it isn't. If we're putting our protection in governments or men or groups, we're going to be in trouble. There's only one place to find protection. And, and our protection, guess where it is? Talk to me. I heard somebody say, where's our protection? Talk to me. In Jesus. Jesus brings us to who? God. But now, my brothers and sisters, God cannot protect in the last days those unless we have gotten into a position where we can receive something. We're going to find out the only ones that God can safely protect during the greatest time of trouble are those that have, guess what? The seal. That's the, what identifies to God you can protect them. Go to Revelation 7. Let's see this. John the Revelator saw our day in Bible prophecy. He sees us in 2021 moving at breathtaking speed toward the seal of God and the mark of the beast. Look at Revelation 7 verse 1. Let's read that loud and clear. What did it say in verse 1 altogether? And after these things, I saw what? Four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow where? On the earth, nor on the sea, nor on... In other words, wind is getting ready to sweep over the world. Trouble. But guess what happens? Verse 2. Let's continue. The Bible says verse 2. All together. And I saw another angel ascending from the east having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels. Now notice what he says, to whom it was given to what? Hurt the earth and the sea. So those angels that were holding, it was really their job to let it go. And they were only holding it until the proper time. And as they get ready to let it go, now let me tell you something. Do you know that they were getting ready to let it go long before 2021? You know that, right? If you read the book, Early Writings, you read through in the 30s. 36, 37, 38, talking about this. You read through other writings. It says that God was about to tell the angels, let go of the wind. The commission had already been given, let go of the wind. And an angel began to tell them, let it go. And that just as they were getting ready to loose it, it says that Jesus looked one last time at the remnant, gave a loving gaze upon them. And as he looked back, he saw that the remnant were not ready. The prophet says, then Jesus turns back to the father and he holds out his hand, the, 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 the near, near wounds glistening in his hands and in his feet. And he says, father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Give them just a little more time. And the father was getting ready to let it go. But he says, when he saw the blood of his son, I will give you whatever you ask. The time that we see in 2021 was bought by the blood of Jesus. Do you understand? The crisis would have broken on before now. We could not have made it to 2021. But God in his mercy has told us. He's given us a little more time. And I believe that Jesus saw us in 2021. I believe he saw with prophetic vision, the generation after generation that will be alive. And he says, Father, give them a little more time. Because if God had let the crisis break by now, some of us wouldn't have been born and most of us wouldn't have been ready. But I'm so glad that he's purchased more time. What do you say? Amen. But how long? Is it forever? We're going to find out there's a limit, my brothers and sisters. Revelation 7 says these angels are holding the winds. And they're holding it for something very specific. And Revelation 7 verse 2. And look at verse 3 now. Verse 3. Elder Smokey, would you read Revelation 7 verse 3, please? Say, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their hands. Now, I want to read that again. Say, hurt not the earth, neither the sea, nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their hands. 
So who are the ones that are going to be protected when the time of trouble breaks upon us? Those that are sealed. So my brothers and sisters, if we are sealed, we're safe. If we're not sealed, we're lost. If we are not sealed, we have no protection. God cannot protect in the greatest time of trouble any of those, but those who have the seal saying, protect him, protect her, protect them. I wonder if this is true for youth and adults. Yes or no? Yes. It's true. We're going to show you that from the Bible. Go to Revelation chapter 9. What book did I say? Revelation. Revelation 9. I want us to see for a moment, before we get deep into the seal, I want us to see, number one, that the ones that are protected are the ones who have the seal. So in the last days, if you want a protection for your family, it's not a location. Somebody says, well, I wonder if I can get here, I'll be protected. If I can just get out of the, the, the arm's way, if I could be somewhere, I'll be protected. I don't care where you are. No protection unless we have the what? Yeah. No physical or spiritual protection. Inspiration says, oh, how many I saw in the time of trouble without a shelter. They were running. They thought they made preparation, but they were not prepared because they did not have the seal. No physical preparation can save us if we, have, if we don't have the seal. The Bible says the ones that are going to be ready are those who have the seal. In fact, let's read this. Early writing 71, I want to focus on a particular part. Now watch what it says. I also saw that many do not realize what they must what? In order to live in the sight of the Lord without a high priest in the sanctuary through the? Now let's read this slowly. Those who receive the seal of the living God and are protected. In the time of trouble. Well, our point is not the rest of that right now. The key is the seal is what shows who is going to be what? Protected. protected. One of the first things the seal is for, the seal is for protection, physical and spiritual protection. Now, my brothers and sisters, most are looking to things for protection. Most are looking for organizations or men for protection. But what we should be looking is for God through his seal to protect us. That means I want the seal. What do you say? Well, then how do you protect your child? Prepare your child for the seal. How would you protect, protect, protect your wife? Helping her to get the... How would you protect yourself? By receiving... Someone said, well, I got a gun. I'm protected. No, 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 no. The way to be protected is to have this seal. So now, my brothers and sisters, first I want to ask, if we're going to get the seal, does that apply to adults and youth equally? Yes or no? Yes. It's just adults. They only want to get the seal. No, no child needs to worry about getting the seal. Is that right? No. Go to Ezekiel. What book did I say? Go to Ezekiel 9. Go to Ezekiel 9. That was Revelation 9. You can remember it easily. Revelation 9, Ezekiel 9. Go to Ezekiel 9. And I want to show you the Bible as we look at Ezekiel chapter 9 and Bible Training Institute that if we want to be protected, we need the seal. This is not just for adults, but this is the entire family. Somebody says, well, surely the older women don't have to worry about this. The older men don't have to worry about this. The infants and babies don't have to worry about this. We're going to find out that the only way to protect the family is to prepare them to receive the seal. Look at Ezekiel 9. Ezekiel chapter 9, we'll begin in verse 1. Uh, Amaya, Ezekiel 9, verse 1, please. What does it say in Ezekiel chapter 9 and verse 1 all together? Uh, 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 Amaya first, excuse me. Now remember Revelation 7. Who had the charge over the city, over the world? Who had the charge? Four angels. Remember? Now those four angels are not just, it's not just four. Those are symbolic of the angelic host that protects the entire world. Now my brothers and sisters, Ezekiel 9 is a little prophecy, but it has end time application. They wrote more for the end time than for their time. Am I right or wrong? All these things are written for our samples upon whom the ends of the world have come. There is an understanding of Ezekiel 9 to help us to understand the seal. In fact, Testimonies to Ministers 444, 445, it says that what Ezekiel saw was the same as John the Revelator in Revelation 7. He said they were seeing the same thing. You'll see as we read it. Look at Ezekiel 9. He says, uh, uh, with a loud voice he heard someone causing them to have charge or control or protection over the city to do what? Draw near. Ezekiel 9 verse 1. Continue. Even every man with his what did these men have in their hand? What did they have? So then what was their mission? What was their mission? Now, remember in Revelation chapter 7, those angels that were holding the winds, what were their mission? They were to what? Hurt or destroy the earth. And so this is the same picture, just in different symbols. Now, these men, the Bible says, it says six of them came from the way of the higher gate. Verse 2, continuing on, verse 2. Which lies toward the north, and every man a slaughter weapon in his 
So what type of destruction is getting ready to take place? A slaughtering. Now look at verse 3. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Sister Chanel, verse 3. Okay, I'm sorry. I, 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 I was looking at, feeling like you finished it, but you didn't finish with his hand. Back in verse 2, I want you to read the last part, verse 2. And one man, would you start this, Sister Chanel? And one man. And one man among them was clothed with So of this six men, one of them did not have a destroying weapon. Of these six men, one of them had not a weapon, but had what in his hand? He had a writer's inkhorn in his hand. Now, what do you do with a writer's inkhorn? What, what do you do with that? Talk to me. Now, what do you do with that, though? What do you do with the, what do you do with the writer's inkhorn? You write. You're right. <laughs> You're right. That's what it's for. You have the writer's inkhorn. You write with that. That's talking about like a pen. That's like a pen. Continue. And they went in and stood beside the brazen so now, if you were in the if you were in the sanctuary, now we'll come back and study this a little bit more deeply. Uh, I don't want to look into that deep right now. But if you were in the sanctuary, the brazen altar is in outer court. So these men came from the way of the, uh, the higher gate. He goes into the brazen altar. If you had the sanctuary up here, they're getting ready to go into, as it were, into the sanctuary. But he comes to the outer court. He comes to, as it were, a threshold, like right here. He comes right here. He doesn't, he doesn't leave, but he comes to the threshold of the house. And he looks out as he's talking to the men that came from a higher gate from out, 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 of, out of court. And he says to them, come in here. And when he tells them to come in, look what he says to do. Look, look at verse uh, uh, 4. Set a what? So now we have another name for seal. Another name for seal is what? So we're going to find out. Remember now, everything that God has, Satan has a counterfeit. So if God has a seal or a mark, then Satan has a seal or a mark. What is Satan's mark called? The mark of the beast. What is God's seal called? The seal of God. So we see these two seals. But God's seal is also called his mark. Now notice what he says. Uh, he says in verse 4, go through the midst of the city. Go through the midst of Jerusalem and set a mark. mark. Continue. Upon the forehead of the men that sigh and that cry for all the abominations that be done in the midst thereof. Now what is that mark going to do for them? Talk to me. What is that mark going to do? It's going to protect them. Protect them from what? The slaughtering, the slaughtering that's getting ready to take place. The destruction is going to take place. Same from Revelation 7. Trouble, hurt is getting ready to come upon the earth. But God says seal them and that seal protects them from the hurt. Revelation 9, same thing. That seal, the very first thing is to do is to protect the people from a coming time of trouble. So my brothers and sisters, Ezekiel 9 tells us, what would you want if you knew that slaughtering was coming? What would you want? Protection. Well, to get protected, what would you need? The seal. So we want to understand what that seal is, how to get it, what it's all about. Is that right? That's our purpose today. Let's go a little further. Now, let's see who gets this seal. Continue. Uh, going on, uh, Sister Kia, verse 5. Who is the others? The other men that had destroying weapons in the hand. So to the other five men, he says, after you mark the people, once you go in, only destroy, only slaughter those that don't have the, the mark or the seal. Let's continue. What does it mean? Don't let your eyes spare. What does it mean? Show no mercy. This is a wrath unmixed with mercy. Mercy has is ended. The, the limit has been reached. Now justice is beginning with no mercy. Unmixed with mercy. The wrath of God. Now, look at the next verse. Going on in the next verse, uh, Mommy, Sister Davis. What does it say in verse 6? Wait a minute. Now, slow down now. Slay utterly what? Continue. Does a dis is a discrimination made about the mark for old people? Yes or no? no. What about young people? No. Do you know that if a young person is going to get ready, they need the seal. If a young person is going to get ready, they need the seal. If an older one is going to get ready, we need the seal. It doesn't matter, old or young, male or female. The key is the seal. Now somebody says, well, they're a child. There's going to be some pity on the child. I'm going to tell you something, no pity on the child. Because even a child is what? known by his doing. 
So what we have to do now is to get our families, old and young, ready for this by preparing them to receive the seal of the living God. Does that make sense? Yes or no? Yeah. All right, let's go a little further. Verse 6 goes on to say, uh, after it says, slay, uh, slay it on the young and old and little children and begin, uh, but come not near any man who is the mark and begin where? Now, I'm not going to read the whole story now. You can read it when you get home. But you'll find out that when Ezekiel sees, just like Jeremiah, he says, is anybody going to be left? It looked as if the majority were slaughtered because the majority were not prepared to receive the seal. Now, later on, we're going to find out what does it take to get the seal. We're not there yet. But we can see that those who receive the seal of the living God and are what? That it is the seal that protects us through Jesus Christ. Can we see that clearly? Yes or no? Now, my brothers and sisters, that brings me to a question. Is there a relationship between the sealing and the shaking? Yes. Look at Maranatha, page 200. Maranatha, let's read that together. Maranatha 200 says, Just as soon as the people of God are sealed and prepared for the shaking, it will come. Is there a relationship between the sealing and the shaking? Yes or no? Yes. What is the message? What we're studying? The sealing, the shaking, and the matter right. We're trying to understand it. There is a direct relationship between the sealing and the shaking. Now, indeed, it has, it has what? Now, what does that tell me? If it's begun already, the shaking. If it's begun already, what does that tell me? It tells me that the shaking and the sealing does not happen all at once. It is a process. The sealing is a what? Process. The shaking is a what? Process. What do we mean by process? It takes time. It doesn't happen. Seal, it says hold till time. Till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. That means the, sh the sealing process has already started. The shaking process has already started. So we need to understand what it is, what's it talking about, what is it all involved, because if it's happening and I don't really know about it, the question is, am I being sealed? And if I'm not being sealed and my family's not being sealed and my children are not being sealed, are we getting ready for protection? And no matter what we're doing, it doesn't matter if we don't have this. My brothers and sisters, the greatest thing you and I can do in the final generation, we got to get this seal. we got to understand what the seal is. So the question is, what is a seal? Is that a good question? Yes. If that's what I need for protection, can you imagine if a man knew he needed something and he found out that what I need is a seal, you know what my next question would be? Well, then what? What? Well, I wouldn't first ask how to get it. I want to know what it is because I might have something and not know I have it. First question would be, what is it? Because then what if you find out that you have it and then you say, well, praise God, I have it already. So the first step is always to ask, what is the thing? This is what God wants to understand. What is a seal? Go to 1 Corinthians. What book did I say? 1 Corinthians. Corinthians chapter 9. We want to understand what a seal is for. Now, before we look at the seal of God, particularly, or the mark of the beast, particularly, we want to understand just the concept of a seal. What, what is it really for? We'll go through the Bible for a little while, and we just want to understand from the Bible what really is a seal all about. Let me see the hands of those who have heard about the seal. Let me see if you heard about the seal before. I see some, um, almost everybody's hand going up. I heard about the seal. Now, do you think that you really understand the seal? Let me see, let me see the hands who fully under, the, the feel they feel they have a good understanding because we're in, you know what type of institute we're in? We're in what? BTI. What is that BTI? Bible Training Institute. So what we're going to do, we're going to go back to the Bible and test our understanding of the seal so that we can intellectually understand and then understand the spiritual experience necessary to receive the seal. Then you'll be able to know for yourself and be able to prove it from the Bible. Right now, thus far, we see that the seal is for one thing thus far. What is the seal for? Protection. Is that clear from the Bible? Yes or no? Yes. All right. Let's go a little further. Uh, we're going to 1 Corinthians 9. Let's see what a seal is talking about. What is a seal talking about? Just generally. And 1 Corinthians 9, look at what the Bible says. And 1 Corinthians 9, uh, Mother Davis, if you'll read this for us, 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 22. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 22. We want to see what the Bible says there. 1 Corinthians 9 and verse 22. What does the Bible say? That's right. And you keep going. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker of the things of Christ, and partaker of the things. All right. And then, sister, uh, not sister, but brother Tim, you continue reading that, please. All 
All right, can, uh, uh, Sister Deb, if you can, if you pick up now. Every man is what? Temperate in what? And look at verse 27. Is it possible to preach to others and still be a castaway? Yes. Now, does the seal mean that we're just preaching to others? Yes or no? no. The seal has not, it's not just simply what we're preaching. The seal has more to do with something about us. Let's see. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 2. Let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 2 now. Let's go to 2 Timothy 2. And let's see. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And I want uh, Brother Tony, if you'll read this for us. 2 Timothy chapter 2. In 2 Timothy chapter 2, we want to notice what the Bible says there. And we want to see what is the seal really all about. 2 Timothy chapter 2. And if you'll read for us verse 19. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. What does the Bible say in verse 19, please? So it says, having this what? That's 2 Timothy 2, verse 19. Having this seal that the Lord knoweth whom are. Yeah. So what does a seal do? What, what, what does a seal do? What, 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 is it, what does it know? Having this seal, the Lord knows whom are. Yeah. In other words, the seal is to provide evidence. Having this seal, the Lord knows whom are yeah. his. We're going to find that the seal is something that shows evidence You'll see later on throughout the Bible, this concept comes to view where it says, if you want to see the seal, Paul says in another place, if you want to see the seal of my apostleship, the what seal of my apostleship, what does it mean by the seal? It's saying, if you want to know, if you want to have what evidence that I am an apostle, I have a seal, something that shows me evidence, another name for what evidence, what is evidence supposed to do? What is evidence trying to accomplish? Prove something. It is to show if something is counterfeit or if something is what? Genuine. genuine. So the seal is to show that something is genuine. I'm going to give you another name for that. Or authentic. What? Authentic. What do you mean by authentic? Real. It's real. Now, so a seal is to be placed upon something saying it's authentic. It's genuine. Somebody right now, they, they, they have these designer clothes and people in fashion, they like it. So another person will come up and he will have a Nike shirt. But then you go into the collar and the tag and there's no seal on it. <laughs> so there's seal, there's no seal on that thing. That, it's not real. It's not authentic. Somebody says it's, it's bootleg. <laughs> but what, what is showing that it is not what? Genuine. So when you put a seal, if, if someone has a document, a government or business, what do they normally want you to do? If you, if you, have, if you own your business, you know what they, they say to us all the time when, when they say if you own your business, they want, when you say something, put it on your official, guess what? letterhead now on your letterhead guess what's on the letterhead your seal it gives credence that this is the organization that it is genuine there is some evidence to it now anything you go in the bible you'll find that this is over and over again in fact what is that right there anybody know what that is what that's a check now is there something that you do to a check to show that it was you you sign the check so now, and when you sign, you know, if you don't put your signing signature on it, you can write money, you can put everything on it. But if you don't put your signature there, it does not make it authentic. Are you following? Yes. So now, in order to get something authentic, you have to sign. Now, question. So then a seal oh, wow. is really a sign. a sign. It's God's signature. We are not authenticated as his children unless we have his sign, unless we have his seal. Now, so if I go to church, but I don't have the seal, I may be a false member of a church, but not real. I'm not genuine. Are you understanding what I'm getting at now? Now, do you see the shaking? Remember, what does the shaking shake out of the church? Those who are not, but those who are not. 
those who are not genuine, those who are not authentic, those who are not really his, there are wheat and there are. Now both look alike, but one is a counterfeit. Are you following? Is there a relationship between the sealing and the shaking? I'm wanting us to study it simply and slowly so we can actually see the shaking never shakes out a child of God. A child of God is not sifted by the shaking. Amen. Even though it's a tough time for him, it is, he is not sifted by the shaking. He is only purified by the shaking. Amen. But now if you are not a child of God, the shaking will blow you out. And it will identify if you're real. It will identify if I'm real. Are you with me? Go to Amos. Let me show you that from the Bible first and we'll come back. Go to Amos chapter 9. I'm hoping that we're beginning to see a little better what the seal is about. Does it make sense thus far? Go to Amos chapter 9, and we want to see in Amos 9 that no one will be shaken out that's really a child of God. Someone says, well, the standards are so high. Did you read the, did you read the, right, uh, uh, the handout I gave you? Yes or no? You read the handout? The shaking handout? I pray you read it. We said you would be ahead. That was homework. That was homework. I didn't waste my good time of printing all this and getting people put it together, and you're not going to read it. Is that right? We got to read this. This is what it is. Now, inside, you'll see a picture. And they had these little seeds, the shaking. Now, you know, that's agriculture terminology. You know, can you tell me some things that are normally shaking? There are other names for that in the Bible. I won't go through all the text today because we're going somewhere else. Sifting. There's another name for that. Threshing. Threshing, am I? Very good. Now, another name. Winnowing. The Bible speaks of winnoweth. And it talks about a winnowing fan. You remember when Jesus said, uh, uh, when they said of him that his fan would be in his hand and he would thoroughly purge his floor. This was in the time of John the Baptist. Now, so we can see that shaking. This is what's going on. Look at Amos chapter 9. Look at Amos 9. Look what the Bible says in Amos 9. We want to pick up in verse 8. This is a powerful chapter, uh, uh, a verse. Amos 9, we'll look at verse uh, 8 beginning. Uh, Amos 9 verse 8. I'll read it with you. Let's read this together. Amos 9 verse 8. It says, Behold, the eyes of the Lord God are upon the what? Sinful kingdom. And I will destroy it. What's he going to destroy? Not the kingdom, but the sinful kingdom. Where? From off the face of the earth, saying that I will not utterly destroy the house of... So look, if the sinful kingdom came into the house of God, he would have to destroy that sinful kingdom inside his house. But how is he going to do it? By what? Shaking. But he says, it's going to be terrible. It's going to be terrible, but it's not going to destroy the, the people of God. Look at verse 9. Next verse. Verse 9 says, For lo, I will command, and I will sift. Give me another name for sift. Shake the house of Israel among nations, like as the plant kingdom is a symbol of this. Agricultural terminology, the shaking, like you do of wheat or rice or grain. You thresh it, you beat it, so that the chaff can be separated from the wheat. Now, it says... Like corn, continue. It says, is sifted in a sieve, yet shall not the least grain fall upon the earth. In other words, he's going to shake it, but even the smallest child of God won't be shaken out. Amen. He will make it. If he's authentically a child of God. Amen. If he is genuinely a child of God. If he's really weak. Does it make sense? So the seal not only protects us, but the seal authenticates and gets evidence that genuinely we are we. We're the children of God and of his kingdom. Does it make sense? All right, let's go a little further. First, King, First Kings 21. Go to First Kings 21. Now, we want to go a little bit more into the sealing. We're going to First Kings 21. Now, what is the seal then? The seal is God's what? Signature. signature. Now, I want to ask you a question. On that check. What is his signature? Does he write down sky no, or no. earth or money? What is the signature? The so the signature that gives evidence is that you don't sign anything, but the signature must be the signing of your what? Name. Of your name. Let's go to 1 Kings 21. I want to show you that this is just basic to a seal. Not just the seal of God, not just the seal of the devil. But just a seal in general. We're talking about a seal in general, understanding it from the Bible. When a person wrote a letter years ago and they would put a seal on it. You know what the seal was for the letter to show? We really sent you the letter. It's authentic. It's not a counterfeit. It's real. First Kings 21. Uh, Sister Shirley, would you read for us, please, verse 8. First Kings 21 and verse 8. Now notice carefully what it says, please. In Ahab's what? Name.
Now, I'm not, I won't go deep into the story, but here Ahab was upset because he wanted some land and he wasn't man enough to know how to deal with it. And so he gets into bed. You know, when you're really depressed, you, you lost your manhood. You get into bed and go to sleep. Pull the covers over your head. I remember one time a phone call came to us, a, a, a female who had called us for four for counseling about marriage. And then we told her the person that you're wanting to marry, he's not ready. He's immature. He's not developed. Now, we're not against the person. Doesn't mean the person can't develop. Doesn't mean they can't. But that person is not mature enough to run a family, either physically or spiritually. They were looking to us for counsel. But when we told them that, you know what happened? They got a little bit offended. Now, I said, now, you came to us for honest counsel. Do you want me to lie to you or give you good counsel? I tell you, this is why I'm in trouble. (laughs) Because of trying to give honest, straight, true counsel that we believe is helpful. You know why? There are too many people that we've counseled that have been divorced and are in a terrible state because they did not find marriage properly. So we gave them this counsel. We, we didn't hear from this person for months. And all of a sudden, we hear news a little bit later. This person that they were wanting to, they, were, they had made the engagement. They were getting ready to be married. But they had to move their uh, things. They were in two different states, <laughs> Brother Bill. They were in two different states. And when they got ready to come together, the man came into some challenges trying to get the woman's stuff moved and his stuff moved just so they can prepare for the marriage to move to a different state. And as they were trying to move it, he got into so much challenges that he didn't know what to do. Money, logistics, practical things that you have to deal with, he couldn't handle it. All of a sudden, she's calling him. What are, you, what are we going to do? Help, uh, uh, give us some guidance. And she's talking to him. He, she can barely hear him. She said, what, what's going on? And guess what happened? He was in bed. Was in bed. <laughs> Literally in bed. I'm not making up, Brother Tim. Literally in bed. The covers, Brother Bill, on his head. How's he going to run a family? He can't even run his own life. He can't. So as you look at this, look, that was the end of that, that situation. She didn't marry him. She came to us again for more counsel. But that's a whole other story. But, but, but the point is, he was not prepared. Are you following me? He was not prepared matured. He did not have the mature experience that could place the authentication on it. Are you following me? Now, my brothers and my sisters, God wants to seal us. That's what happened to Ahab. Ahab was not mature. And so his wife, Jezebel, Uh said, don't worry. What's wrong with you? She cried. Aren't you the king? How are you going to be in bed? You're the king. Now, this literally happened. You can read it yourself. (laughs) Bible, interesting. You don't have to read. You don't have to ever look at no uh, soap opera or anything like that. You just go to the Bible and all the drama is there. If you read it, and so you go in and you start reading it, you'll begin to start finding out that the Jezebel then said, look, I'll I'll take care of it for you. Continue to sleep. I'll take care of it. And she took care of it. Wrong way, but she took care of it. So, but what does she need? What does she need in order to take care of it? She needed to use his seal. So she wrote letters in his name and then sealed it with, which tells me there's a relationship between the seal and a name. So when you get a signature, what is being signed on the check? What do you write on that check, Brother Bill? What do you sign? Your Your own name. What do you sign, Brother Tim? Your own name. So my brother and sister, I want us to see clearly the the relationship between the seal and the name. Can we see that? Yes or no? Go to Esther. Go to Esther chapter 3. Go to Esther chapter 3. We're trying to better understand this seal. Go to Esther 3. I want you to understand the seal. Esther chapter 3. So the seal, number one, is for protection. Number two, it is to give evidence of the genuine uh, signature that this is mine. He sets this seal that the Lord knows who are his. That's what the seal is for. This is mine. This is not mine. So the mark of the beast says you are Satan's. The seal of God says you are mine. Mark of the beast says you're really a tear. The seal of God says, no, you're really a wheat, the child of the kingdom. Now, look what the Bible says. We go a little further. What book did I tell you to go to? Esther, chapter 3. Let's go there. Esther 3. And uh, Sister Melissa, if you'll read this for us, please. Esther, chapter 3. And I want you to read verse 10. Now, I want you to see something for a moment. We're going to find out that in the Bible days, especially a king, he didn't just take and just write his name like this. He didn't just take his name and curse of his name and do that. He normally used something that caused the signature of the seal. He normally used something. And we'll see. Go in the Bible to Esther 3, and let's see if we can find out what this is. Esther 3, and we want to start in verse 10. Uh, Sister Melissa, if you read that for us, please. Esther 3, 
and verse 10. Now, bottom of all these stories is really the plan of this we were putting together. Now, Esther 3, verse 10. What does the Bible say? So the king took his ring from his hand and gave it to who? Amen. I wonder why the king, Brother Tim, would take his ring from his hand. I wonder what he was doing. Let's continue. Continue. Next verse. Twelve. Then were the king's scribes called on the thirteenth day of the first month, and there was written according to all that Heman had commanded unto the king's lieutenant and to the governors that were over every province. So over all the land. Now watch what happens. Continue. Now watch how deep the Bible is. Watch it. In the name. Continue. <laughs> so there was a name. And there was a ceiling. Based on this king's name. We see the name and the ceiling go together. Now you won't find out later on. That's why the people who received the seal. The 144,000. The people of God. They had the father's Name. name written in their forehead. Now, we're going to find out this name. Let's go a little further. We're going, because we need to find out what this seal is. Now, the Bible says that, they, that he was sealed it how? Sealed it how? With what? So now, we're going to find out that in the Bible, when something was sealed, there was normally an instrument that was connected with the seal. And what was connected with it? The ring. The ring. And the ring was not really so much a, 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 to be used just as a, a, as a person would use it today. Although they had it, it was for something very specifically. Now, I want to ask you a question. Here's this ring. Where is the first time in the Bible that you can think about a ring being used? The first time in the Bible. That's in Luke. That's in Luke. <laughs> You're in New Testament. The first time in the Bible. That's good thinking. Good thinking. But the first time in the Bible. What, what, if I talk about beginning or first, what book do you think of? Genesis. So now think of something in Genesis. <laughs> Joseph! I mean, Sister Vicky just came right on back. I, I, I missed that student there, boy. Woo, this is good. Praise the Lord. Now, let's go, let's, go, let's go to Genesis. Let's go back now. Where would I find the story of Joseph then? Genesis. Genesis. Now, it's in, in 30s, but well, I want to get particularly to Genesis 40. Let's go to Genesis 40. Now, let's follow the case now. In Genesis 40, watch what the Bible says in Genesis chapter 40. We see now that this seal gives authenticity. It gives evidence, genuineness. It normally is the seal of, the, of someone signing their name to say, yes, it's mine. Now, in Genesis chapter 40, uh, 40 we see something very interesting. Uh, Genesis 40, uh, 41, excuse me, Genesis 41 and verse 40. Genesis 41, verse 40. I want you to watch what happens now. All right. Uh, could you read for us, Sister Vicky? Genesis 41, verse 40, please. I'm sorry, 41, verse 40. Excuse me. Genesis 41, verse 40. Now, what I want you to do, don't, don't just listen to what I said. This is Bible Train Institute. I, I, I'm testing you right now. Tell me what you think that this ring is for. Let me see if I put it up. Yes. Let me, tell me what you think this ring is for. There's a ring here. Let's continue. Only where? So what did Pharaoh say to Joseph? What, 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 tell me what, what, what Pharaoh, in essence, was saying to Joseph. This ring, you're, the, you're the top dog other than being right in this ring. You're the top. And the only way, and he said, he, he's really saying you're even over me. And the only time that you're not over me is when I'm sitting on my throne. Oh, wow. Do you know that when everything happened in Egypt, J the Pharaoh went to Joseph before it happened? Right. He's like, talk to that man. Somebody said, well, can we do this? And talk to Joseph. Can we do it? Talk to Joseph. <laughs> it's almost like here's a husband who's supposed to be the head of the house. You know what happens? Talk to my wife. Talk to my wife. This is not government. But, but, but here, Joseph, when he came in, Joseph, as he as looked at this, Joseph actually had restructured the government, not by him physically doing it, but by them seeing that he was superior. 
They said, look, Joseph, you're the only one who knows how to go through this time of trouble. I'm telling you something, where Joseph was in Egypt, every seven day Adventist is to become to the world. But it only happens when we understand something. But that's a, another study. So, so the Bible said in Genesis 40 that he's saying, only on the throne I'll be great and now continue. Verse 41, sister. How much of the land? Now, then he says, I'm going to, I'm giving you the answer already, but, but then he said to him, I'm going to give you something to show you that I set you over everything. Oh, yes. 42. 42, continue. Now, question, why did he give him specifically this ring? What, what, what was he doing when he gave him this ring? What was he doing? What was he really doing? So we're going to find out. Let me see. Nah, I didn't put it there. Okay, so what we're going to find out is that this ring was really a symbol of guess what? Of power. A symbol of power. A symbol of authority. So that when Moses, when, when not Moses, but when Joseph had the ring, he was in power and authority. And when, 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 when uh, uh, Ahasuerus gave Haman the ring, what was it saying he had at that time? Power. Authority and power. Now remember now in the beast, the dragon gave him his power, his seat and great authority. So we're going to find out that the ring is simply a symbol of what? Power and authority. So God has a ring. God has a sealing ring. But not one that you put in your finger like that. God's ring is simply the symbol, because the ring was just a symbol. It was a symbol of his what? Power and of his what? Authority. So my question would be, where would I look to find God's ring? God's power. God's symbol of authority. He said, Ten Commandments. Now, what text, I said, what text would make you think to look in the commandments for his ring or his symbol of authority. What, what text would make you say, look to the commandments? No, no, just jump to me in the text. <laughs> tell me what text would tell you that? 20, Exodus 20 won't tell me that. That's a good thing. It will come there, but Exodus 20 won't tell me that. What text would tell me to look for the seal? See, we want to understand this simply from the Bible. Exodus, that, now, 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 now that's good, sister. Now that's good. Now, that's not where I want to go yet, but that's, that's very good, though. That's, now she's talking about Exodus 31 where it says that he's given us signs. His signs. That's true. But watch what this says. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah 8. We want to know why would we ever think to even look to the law or to the commandments? Because as Mother David said, there's something in those Ten Commandments. Very good. And as my sister said, there's something in Exodus 31, but we want to get the basic principle and we want to see it simply from the Bible. Go to Isaiah chapter 8. Go to Isaiah chapter 8, and I want you to see this clearly for yourself. Oh, this, so when I look, I say, Lord, this is so good. <laughs> the Bible is sweet, brothers and sisters. Now, watch what the Bible says. Isaiah 8. Isaiah chapter 8. And uh, Brother Wheel, if you read this for me. It's good to see you, my friend. Isaiah 8. And if you will read for us verse 16. Watch what the Bible says. Now, read this slowly, Brother Wheel. This is good stuff. Now, read it slow. Watch what it says now. I love this. This, this is good. Man, are you, is this is good to you as it is to me. This is good, brothers and sisters. I mean, taste and see the Lord is good. I, I love the man this Bible is good. Watch. See, when you, when you have to make nothing up, everything you believe is right there in the Word of God. All seven day Adventism is, is the religion of the Bible. And if a man would just believe the Bible, he would have to become a seven day Adventist. It would help us to clean up. Watch now. Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8, verse 16. Brother Will. Do what? Bind up the testimony. Give me another name. Continue. The law where among my disciples. What does that tell me? That the seal is in the law. Amen. Praise God. Man, this is my, man, I say it for you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> this is good stuff. So my brothers and sisters, that tells me then that if I want to find the seal, where would I have to go? Where would I need to look in order to find God's seal? I've got to go to the law. The seal is in the law. And Satan sought to remove the seal from the law. Why? If you remove the seal, there is no evidence of its authenticity. You don't know that you can really follow that law. I mean, what if a man right now just started writing laws in Virginia? New law. Throw trash on the ground every two days. 
And next time police stop you, <laughs> what are you doing? Well, I just read this law. I said, throw trash on the ground every two days. So I'm throwing trash on the ground. He said, you have the right, right to remain silent. <laughs> He'd take you out of there. But why? Because some of you say, well, there's this law. He said, well, where'd that come from? I don't know, but it's a law. That law has no authority. That law has no authenticity. That law has no evidence of genuineness. It has to have power backing it. Are you following me? Yeah. So the signature and the seal give authority to the law backing it. Now, my brothers and sisters, we are to look for the seal in the law of God. Now, you'll find out. Go to Daniel 6 for a moment. Go to Daniel 6 for a moment. Go to Daniel, the sixth chapter, and I want you to see something. What we're going to see is what it is. See, the ring wasn't the real thing. Somebody, look, oh, they're looking for God's ring. But that's not what it's talking about. That's not where you're going to find the seal. The ring was only a sign. The ring was only a what? A sign. A sign. We're going to show you that. Look at Daniel chapter 6. We'll look at this text. This text is deep, so we'll come back to it. We have to look at the, get the first layer. We'll come back and look at it another time. But look at Daniel 6, just the first layer. Verse 17. Look at Daniel 6, verse 17. Watch what the Bible says in Daniel 6, verse 17. Brother Tony, if you'll read that for us, please. Daniel 6 and verse 17. What does the Bible say? The king did what? Sealed it. Now continue. Stop. He sealed it with his signet. What is a signet? A sign. So the king sealed the stone with his sign. What was it? Where did he get that sign from? His ring. Just like in Esther, just like in Genesis. So my question, brothers and sisters, is it was the key the ring or was the key the sign? It was the signet. It's what the sign made. It wasn't the instrument of the ring. It's the sign that was the significant thing. You can have a bunch of rings, but no sign. It doesn't mean anything. So the key, the significance is not the ring, but what it symbolizes. It's a sign. It has power. It's authority. It's the sign of power and authority. That's what a seal is. Are you following me? Yes. So my brothers and sisters, if that is the signet or the sign, then we should go back in the Bible and find out, does God have a seal or a sign? Because if he does, that's his seal. Go to Romans chapter 4. Go to Romans 4 and we'll see it in plain language that the Bible says, just like we read, it's not the ring. It's the seal or the sign that the words seal and sign are used in the Bible interchangeably. Look at uh, what the Bible says in Romans chapter 4 and you'll see what we just studied in plain language. In Romans chapter 4. I love that all the Bible agrees from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Romans chapter 4. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 11. Elder Smokey, verse 11, please. Romans 4 and verse 11. What does the Bible say in verse 11? And he the sign. Wait a minute now. He received what? Now watch what the Bible says. He got a sign. That's a signet. Continue. A Wait a minute. I thought he just had a sign. What's he doing with the seal now? It's the same thing. It was the same thing. A sign is a seal and a seal is a sign. So the sign of circumcision was the sign of righteousness by faith. So when they were circumcised, it wasn't supposed to be that, that literal act of circumcision saved the Israelites. That was to be a sign that they were believing in the God who would circumcise their hearts from all filthiness and flesh. It was a sign of separation from sin through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. It was the righteousness by faith. So my brothers and sisters, in short, without reading the rest of the verse, verse 11, you can read the whole thing, but verse 11 says, and he received the sign of circumcision, which was a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So that tells me that a sign and a seal are the same thing. So if I want to find out what God's seal is, because that's how I get protected. If I want to find out what God's seal is, I'm not looking for his ring. That was just a signet. I'm looking for his what? Sign. Because a seal and a sign are the same thing. So I want to find God's sign or his seal. Where do I look? His law because he says seal my law. Bind up the testimony. So I see a seal which is a binding. You will understand that later on. A seal binds a document. It makes it binding. That's why Daniel's, uh, 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 the, the king in Daniel's time sealed the stone to make it binding. So my brothers and sisters, it seals or binds something. When you put a seal on a, uh, 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 a jar, what are you doing with that jar? 
you're binding it. You're closing it up. You put a seal on a document. What are you doing? Binding it. You know, sometimes you buy, buy a machine that's electronic and they'll put a seal on it. And they say, if you break this seal, the warranty is void. Because they know that you may have got in and start tampering or something. You messed it up. It wasn't natural. So they keep that seal. And the reason why it's there is to let you know that it's been unbroken. Yes. Yes. And they will know that no one else opened it so that the document was genuine. It was original, untouched. Are we together? Yes. All right, let's go a little further. So now we're trying to find out. We know that the seal is a sign. We want to find out God's sign. We look to his law. But can we find what that sign is? Ezekiel 20. Let's go to Ezekiel 20. Because if I get this, I'm protected. Do you want to be protected? Yes or no? Yes. Ezekiel 20. Notice what the Bible says in Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Ezekiel 20, and Amaya, if you read this for us, Ezekiel chapter 20, and verse 12, Ezekiel 20, and verse 12, watch what the Bible says now, I want to see if you following, Ezekiel 20, verse 12, what does the Bible say? Wait a minute, he said, I gave them something, Ezekiel 20, verse 12, he said, I gave them what? I gave them my... Sabbaths. I wonder why that's important. He gave them my what? Sabbaths. Sabbaths. Ezekiel 20 verse 12. Would it continue? If you were of uh, the Bible. And if a man would just believe the Bible, he would have to become a seven day Adventist. It would help us to clean up. Watch now. Isaiah 8. Isaiah 8 verse 16. Brother Will. Do what? Bind up the testimony. Give me another name. Continue. The law where among my disciples. What does that tell me? That the seal is in the law. Amen. Praise God. Man, this is my, man, I say it for you. Praise the Lord. <laughs> this is good stuff. So my brothers and sisters, that tells me then that if I want to find the seal, where would I have to go? Where would I need to look in order to find God's seal? I've got to go to the law. The seal is in the law and Satan sought to remove the seal from the law. Why? If you remove the seal, there is no evidence of its authenticity. You don't know that you can really follow that law. I mean, what if a man right now just started writing laws in Virginia? New law, throw trash on the ground every two days. And next time police stop you. <laughs> what are you doing? Well, I just read this law. I said throw trash on the ground every two days. So I'm throwing trash on the ground. He said, you have the right, right to remain silent. <laughs> He'd take you out of there. But why? Because some of you say, well, there's this law. He said, well, where'd that come from? I don't know, but it's a law. That law has no authority. That law has no authenticity. That law has no evidence of genuineness. It has to have power backing it. Are you following me? Yeah. So the signature and the seal give authority to the law backing it. Now, my brothers and sisters, we are to look for the seal in the law of God. Now you'll find out, go to Daniel 6 for a moment. Go to Daniel 6 for a moment. Go to Daniel the 6th chapter and I want you to see something. What we're going to see is what it is. See, the ring wasn't the real thing. Somebody, oh, they're looking for God's ring. But that's not what it's talking about. That's not where you're going to find the seal. The ring was only a sign. The ring was only a what? A sign. A sign. We're going to show you that. Look at Daniel chapter 6. We'll look at this text. This text is deep, so we'll come back to it. We have to look at the, get the first layer. We'll come back and look at it another time. But look at Daniel 6, just the first layer. Verse 17. Look at Daniel 6, verse 17. Watch what the Bible says in Daniel 6, verse 17. Brother Tony, if you'll read that for us, please. Daniel 6 and verse 17. What does the Bible say? The king did what? Sealed it. Now continue. Stop. He sealed it with his signet. What is a signet? A sign. So the king sealed the stone with his sign. What was it? Where did he get that sign from? His ring. Just like in Esther, just like in Genesis. So my question, brothers and sisters, is it was the key the ring or the key the sign? It was the signet. It's what the sign made. It wasn't the instrument of the ring. It's the sign that was the significant thing. You can have a bunch of rings, but no sign. It doesn't mean anything. So the key, the significance is not the ring, but what it symbolizes. It's a sign. It has power. It's authority. It's the sign of power and authority. That's what a seal is. Are you following me? Yeah. 
So my brothers and sisters, if that is the signet or the sign, then we should go back in the Bible and find out, does God have a seal or a sign? Because if he does, that's his seal. Go to Romans chapter four. Go to Romans four and we'll see it in plain language that the Bible says, just like we read, it's not the ring. It's the seal or the sign that the word seal and sign are used in the Bible interchangeably. Look at uh, what the Bible says in Romans chapter four and you'll see what we just studied in plain language. In Romans chapter four. I love that all the Bible agrees from Genesis to the book of Revelation. Romans chapter four. Notice what the Bible says beginning in verse 11. Elder Smokey, verse 11, please. Romans four and verse 11. What does the Bible say in verse 11? And he the sign. Wait a minute now. He received what? Now watch what the Bible says. He got a sign. That's a signet. Continue. A Wait a minute. I thought he just had a sign. What's he doing with the seal now? It was the same thing. A sign is a seal. And a seal is a sign. So the sign of circumcision was the sign of righteousness by faith. So when they were circumcised, it wasn't supposed to be that, that literal act of circumcision saved the Israelites. That was to be a sign that they were believing in the God who would circumcise their hearts from all filthiness and flesh. It was a sign a separation from sin through the power and the blood of Jesus Christ. It was the righteousness by faith. So my brothers and sisters, in short, without reading the rest of the verse, verse 11, you can read the whole thing, but verse 11 says, and he received the sign of circumcision, which was a seal of the righteousness of faith, which he had yet being uncircumcised. So that tells me that a sign and a seal are the same thing. So if I want to find out what God's seal is, because that's how I get protected. If I want to find out what God's seal is, I'm not looking for his ring. That was just a signet. I'm looking for his what? Sign. Because a seal and a sign are the same thing. So I want to find God's sign or his seal. Where do I look? His law because he says seal my law. Bind up the testimony. So I see a seal which is a binding. You will understand that later on. A seal binds a document. It makes it binding. That's why Daniel's, uh, 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 the, the king in Daniel's time sealed the stone to make it binding. So my brothers and sisters, it seals or binds something. When you put a seal on a, uh, 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 a jar, what are you doing with that jar? You're binding, you're binding it. You're closing it up. You put a seal on a document. What are you doing? Binding it. You know, sometimes you buy, buy a machine that's electronic and they'll put a seal on it. And they say, if you break this seal, the warranty is void. Because they know that you may have got in and start tampering or something. You messed it up. It wasn't natural. So they keep that seal. And the reason why it's there is to let you know that it's been unbroken. Yes. They used to take the scroll and they would put the wax and put the seal right on that so that it would seal the scroll. Yes. And they would know that no one else opened it so that the document was genuine. It was original, untouched. Are we together? Yes. All right, let's go a little further. So now we're trying to find out, we know that the seal is a sign. We want to find out God's sign. We look to his law, but can we find what that sign is? Ezekiel 20. Let's go to Ezekiel 20. Because if I get this, I'm protected. Do you want to be protected? Yes or no? Yes. Ezekiel 20. Notice what the Bible says in Ezekiel, the 20th chapter. Ezekiel 20. And Amaya, if you read this for us. Ezekiel chapter 20. And verse 12. Ezekiel 20. And verse 12. Watch what the Bible says now. I want to see you following. Ezekiel 20 verse 12. What does the Bible say? Moreover, also I gave them my Wait a minute. He said, I gave them something. Ezekiel 20 verse 12. He said, I gave them what? I gave them my Sabbath. Sabbaths. I wonder why that's important. He gave them my what? Sabbaths. Sabbaths. Ezekiel 20 verse 12. Would it continue? To be a Sabbath. Whoa! He gave them my Sabbath to be a what? Sign. So tell me something, brothers and sisters, that there's a seal and the seal is a sign and God's sign is his what? So if you got the right Sabbath and it's placed on you, you're protected. Amen. So my brothers and sisters, this tells me if you have the right Sabbath placed on you, that it gives you evidence that you're a child of God. You're weak. You're not a tear. You won't be shaken out. You'll remain. So now, my brothers and sisters, I want this seal. What do you say? Amen. It says, and my Sabbaths continue. You're reading 12, continue. 
So it, it gives evidence of something. Evidence. That I am the Lord that Verse 20. In other words, keep my Sabbath holy or hollow. Don't wean my hollowness. Don't have Halloween. But hollow my Sabbaths and continue. And they shall be a sign. So he said, my Sabbaths are a what? Sign between me and you, that ye may know Evidence. That I am the Lord. Now that tells me something. God, now watch this. God's seal is God's sign. And God's sign, he didn't say is a Sabbath. He says what? So God's Sabbath is my or God's Sabbath. So God has a Sabbath. But watch now. Everything that God has, Satan has a. We found another name for seal was what? Mark. So then Satan has a seal or a what? Mark. And Satan's mark is Satan's what? Uh -uh. Satan's mark is Satan's what? It's the same thing. Satan's mark is Satan's what? Sign. And Satan's sign is Satan's what? So that tells us that there must be two Sabbaths. One symbolizing the seal of God, the mark of God, and the other symbolizing the seal of Satan or the mark of the beast. That's right. So my brothers and sisters, can you see it clearly? Yes. And the, the person that wears the seal of Satan or the mark of the beast is evidence that they are the children of the wicked one. That's a tear. God that cannot have them in his church. The seal of God is a sign or evidence of his child. Genuine. This is mine. He sets this seal. He knows who are his. And it doesn't matter what we profess is getting that seal that's going to protect us. It's getting that evidence from God of genuine that's going to keep us. So my brothers and sisters, I want that seal, the Sabbath. So we have to know which one then is God's Sabbath. Because there are many people today that believe that they know what day the Sabbath is. Am I right? <laughs> but the right Sabbath is the right, is the right seal. And the wrong Sabbath is the wrong seal. You go to the world. They know that. The wrong seal is the mark of the beast. I was at a bank one time. person gave me a card. And I looked at the card. And on the back of it, it said 666. That was the last three digits. And so, uh, uh, seeking to open up a door for a conversation, I turned to the bank and said, oh. And they, what, what happened? I said, look, you gave me a car. This on the back says 666. What are you trying to do? <laughs> and the person, oh, no, you know. You know, they, they've had the chip and, and the different other things. They're talking about the new, the new uh, car. Now it has the, what, the, the, um, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, microchip. the microchip inside the car. The new one, you just wave it. And, and so they, they were trying to give me the car. And they, they're talking about, and they say, I, I said, is that interesting? And no, damn, this may have something to do with the mark of the beast. The world is on their mind. But they don't understand it. See, they don't understand that it is a sign. The seal, the mark is a sign, a signet. And it is talking about God's Sabbath or Satan's Sabbath. Now, my brothers and sisters, we then need to find out what is God's Sabbath. I should find God's Sabbath in, he, in God's law. That's where he put his seal. Go to Isaiah, uh, uh, Ezekiel, uh, Exodus. Exodus now. Exodus 20. We're going to Mother David's text. <laughs> Exodus 20. In Exodus 20, the Bible doesn't leave us to guess whatsoever as to what his seal is. Exodus chapter 20. We're going to Exodus 20. Exodus chapter 20. And I want us to understand it simply today. I'm trying to take our time. Am I going too fast? No. Praise the Lord. I'm slowing down, Brother Bill. <laughs> Exodus chapter 20. Look what the Bible says in Exodus 20. Let's pick up in verse 8. Would you read that for us, uh, Mother Davis? Exodus 20, verse 8. Now remember, God signed of his seal. Let's find out what it is. Continue. So those six days are not the Sabbath. Seven. Verse 10. But, but the seventh, seventh day is the Sabbath, Sabbath of what? The Lord. So that's his Sabbath. So God's Sabbath, that's God's Sabbath. He said my Sabbath, God. So God's Sabbath, the Bible says is what? The seventh day. So then God's seal is what? The seventh day Sabbath. We need that to be protected. If we don't understand that, we won't get protected. Now, my brothers and my sisters, that tells me then, do you know that no one in the, no one in the world can find a text in the Bible that says another day is the Sabbath, a true Sabbath, a biblical Sabbath, other than the seventh day Sabbath. You can't find it from Genesis to Revelation. It doesn't exist. 
I've met men all over the world. I've talked to them all over the world. And I challenged those who, when they wanted to talk about this, I challenged, show me. Just show me from the Bible. It doesn't exist. Now, my brothers and sisters, we should humbly be able to give an answer for the reason that's within us. With meekness and fear. Now, so we see that the seven days got Sabbath. But, you know, there's another day that the most of the world honors as a Sabbath. You know, all over the world, there's only two great Sabbath days. There are little minor days. Some may say Wednesday, Thursday, Sabbath, some are Friday. But of the world, you can divide and have only two great days of people wondering what the Sabbath is. You know the Sabbath, what they say? They either say it's the seventh day or the what? First day. Now, my brothers and sisters, that's not the real thing. Not the ring. It's a signet, a sign. And we found out what it is. Now, watch what this says. The Lord commands by the same prophet, bind up what? And do what? Seal the law among my disciples. Isn't this a prophet, brothers and sisters? Watch what she says. Great controversy, 451. The seal of God's law is found where? Did we not just read it ourselves? This only of all ten brings to view both the name and the title of the Do you know that the fourth commandment brings his name and his title? That's what the sealing is for. It gives authenticity, authenticity to the law. It declares him to be the creator of the heavens and the earth and thus shows his claim to reverence and worship above all others. Aside from this precept, there is nothing in the Decalogue or the Ten Commandments to show whose authority the law is given. It's just like the man who said throw trash on the ground every two days. When the Sabbath was changed by the that's who sought to change times and laws, the seal was what? Taken from the law. Now some people question the authority of the law. The disciples of Jesus are called upon to restore it by exalting the Sabbath of the Do you know why people think that the law is nailed to the cross? Because of the seal being removed. See, if, if the law had no authority, then you get rid of it. But by changing the Sabbath, people thought they could change the law. So it, it took away the seal and the authority of that law. It says, by exalting the Sabbath, the full commandment to its rightful position as the creator's memorial and the sign of his authority. So the fourth commandment is the sign of his authority. Now, remember, this, the ring was a symbol of what? When Joseph got it, it said it was his what? Power and authority. Now, I want to ask you a question. Why would the fourth commandment Sabbath, I want to see if you understand the principle, the principle. Why would the fourth commandment Sabbath show us the sign of God's power and authority? Why would it do that? What, what, is, what is it about the fourth commandment that does it? Has his name? Sister Melissa! Now, that's, that, that, that's what I want to say. See, that's the principle. It doesn't matter the details about it like that, but that's the principle right there. It's because he identifies himself as the what? Creator. That's the key right there. We've got to understand the simplicity of the key. Go to Jeremiah. Let me show you that from the Bible. Go to Jeremiah 10. Go to Jeremiah 10. Any time in the Bible where God wants to show that he is a true God and not a false God, he only points to one thing. When he wants to show someone in a false God, a, a God that's not genuine, really no God at all, he points to something. Let's go to Jeremiah 10 and let's see that. Go to Jeremiah 10. Let's see that from the Bible. Jeremiah 10. Jeremiah 10. Sister Davis, you read, if you read this for us, please. Jeremiah 10. And we want to notice what the Bible says beginning in 10, verse 10. Jeremiah 10, 10. Jeremiah 10 and verse 10. Now watch what it says now. Jeremiah 10 and verse 10. Now, what is, what is he trying to talk about right now? That God is what? What does he want to give? He wants to give. What does he want to give? Genuineness. genuineness. What else? Evidence. He wants to give the evidence and the genuineness of him. The true, not the false. Let's see what he does. Continue. He is the living God. And what type of God? Living. Now, don't remember the seal, the, the seal of the living God. Let's continue. Verse 11. The gods that have what? Not, not made the what? The heavens and the earth. Even they shall perish from the earth. So what did he point to to show who is the true God, who is the false God? His ability, his power to create. What does Satan not have? The power to create. 
What is the Sabbath or the fourth commandment? A memorial or a sign of his power to create. What does the first angel direct this to? Fear God, give glory to him for the hour of his judgment come and worship him that made heaven and earth and sea and the fountains of waters. Now, look what the Bible says in, in verse 10, uh, 12, excuse me, verse 12. Continue on, verse 12. How? Stop. So how was the earth made or created? The earth was created by his what? So then creation is just a symbol of his power and authority. So when I go to the law and find something that talks about his power to create, I'm looking at the sign of his power and authority, which is his seal, his sign. Are you following? So my brothers and my sisters, this is what the devil doesn't want us to see. That's the only reason to worship God. Worship him that made heaven and earth. What is the foundation of worship? Whoever creates you. That's who you should worship. If the devil created you, worship him. But if God created us, then worship him. Does it make sense? All right. Let's watch it now. Here's the seal of God. Well, someone says, well, I know the seven days of Sabbath, so I'm safe. Not all who profess to keep the Sabbath will be sealed. So not just because we profess to keep the Sabbath. Yes, the Sabbath is the seal, but it doesn't mean that we have been sealed. See, protection does not come simply because you know the seven days of the Sabbath. That's not the protection. The protection comes if you are sealed. You know, some people make it read in Revelation 7. Revelation 7 says, hurt not the earth until you become a seven Adventist. That's not, that's not what the Bible said. It says, hurt not the earth or the persons who have the, until the people of God are what? Sealed. It doesn't say, if you know what the seal is, you are sealed. That's not what the Bible says. The protection comes in the process of being sealed. Am I sealed? The sign does not mean that you're sealed. Are you following? So what we have to do now is find out how do I get what? I know what the seal is now. The seal is the sign of God's power. It gets evidence of who are his, who are his children. Because of his power to save and create and redeem. But how do I get sealed? Let's go a little further. A seal equals a what? Sign. Or a mark. There are two. The true seal of God is his what? Seventh day Sabbath. The false seal or the mark of the beast is what? The Sunday Sabbath, a tradition. Now I want to ask you a question. What has to happen before we're sealed? Anybody know? Do, what, do you know what you put your seal on? Do you know what to put the seal on? You put your seal on something. You know when you put the seal on something? When it's yours, that's, that's good, that's good, that, that, that's good, that's true. When it's yours, go to Psalms. Let me, let's go to the Bible. Go to Psalm 37. What do we put on, when, when, when will God put his seal or mark upon us? When will we be sealed or marked? Go to Psalms 37. Go to Psalms 37, and let's see. Psalms 37, and Sister Kia. Psalms 37 and verse 37. 37, 37. You can remember it very easily. Psalms 37 and verse 37. What does it say there? Now watch carefully now. The Bible is so good. I heard, I heard somebody, mm, they, it sounds like someone, you have a good meal, you, mm, you don't even say that. <laughs> that thing is good. Is this Bible good? <laughs> Look at Psalm 37. 37, Sister Kia. Somebody going to read it before you if you don't read it. <laughs> mark the what? Talk to me, somebody. You mark the what? So guess what? Just knowing the seven days of the Sabbath doesn't put the seal on you. God only marks the man. Now you, you're behind this now. <laughs> Psalm 37, 37. God only marks the man who is what? Perfect. Perfect. So then what must God do before he can seal us? Bring us back to perfection. And then seal us. Is that the work of the sanctuary? Is that what has to happen before the game is over? Yes. Is, does the world understand this? Yes. The world does not understand this. But the world needs to understand this. Now, let's go a little further. Go to Ezekiel 28. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, do, do we, I'll, I'll let you read the full, full text. Would you read the full text, please? Psalms 37, 37. Mark 
Now, follow this now. It says, mark the perfect man and then do what? And then what? So, when is the man made perfect? At the beginning or the end? All right. Now, you, do you know what the perfection means? Completion. You finished something. You finished something. So it's perfect, perfect man is a man when he's completed. He's brought to an end. That's what the, what the Bible is talking about here. He's full. Now go to Ezekiel 28. Let me show you something. You go to Ezekiel 28. Ezekiel the 28th chapter. And we're going to see this is what has to happen at the end of time. God must bring us back to perfection that shows that the game can come to an end. The game is over when either we have perfectly been reproduced in the image of Satan or that we're perfectly reproduced in the image of God. This is going to bring us to the end of the game. Now, look what the Bible says in Ezekiel 28. And look at things that you may not have paid attention to, but the Bible is deep. Look at Ezekiel 28. My teacher used to say, the Bible is deep. <laughs> you know that thing, man. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Look what the Bible says in verse 12. Uh, Elder Smokey. Ezekiel 28, verse 12. Watch what it says. Speaking of Lucifer in tight. Now slow down. Thou sealest up the sum. Continue. Now remember, complete means, the perfect means what? Complete or full. So it says, thou sealest the sum full of wisdom and perfect and beauty. You seal something when it is what? Perfect. Now he sealed up the sum. There was no created being that could have been made more perfect than Lucifer was made. But something marred his perfection. Something marred his perfection. You know what it was? Sin. Can we have sin, iniquity, sin found in him? If we have sin in us, can God seal us with the seal of God? He could not mark us if we still have sin in us. Now watch this now. Here's the seal of God. It says, Sunday shopping ban where? Now, where did this first Sunday Sabbath come from? Where did, it, where, where did it come from in Christian times? It says the Croatian parliament, this is a newspaper, USA Today. The Croatian parliament has passed a law forcing shops to close on Sundays. On what? Sunday. In concession to the Roman Catholic Church. Now why are they closing on Sunday? Because of who? The Roman so somehow the world understands that Sunday has something to do with what? Rome. Rome. Yeah. Let's go a little further. Here's the Converts Catechism of Catholic Doctrine. You know what a catechism is? Anybody know what a catechism is? What's a catechism? It's um, the Catholic's like, rule book, essentially. A rule book, okay, yes. Uh, in, in, in simple, a catechism is like a, a teaching aid that you give to a new convert. So if, if a person just becomes a Catholic or wants to become a Catholic, they take them through catechism classes. And the catechisms is supposed to be educating them into the tenets of their faith. They give them an understanding of what they believe. So here is the, uh, the, one of the newest editions. I have, the, I have the, one of the newest editions that they printed. And it says the same, different pages, but the same thing. Question, which is the... Sabbath. Now, this is not Protestants or Seventh-day Adventists. This is Catholic. This is Rome. Question, which is the Sabbath? The answer is Saturday is the... Sabbath. So what would be a, your natural question? If you were getting catechized, taught... Uh-uh, uh-uh. Not right now. Shut up. Just, just listen. It's okay. Good. What? Saturday the Sabbath. Question. Why do we observe what? Sunday. Sunday. I mean, imagine. If, you're going to, if you just said the Saturday the Sabbath, and then you're told that we're going to church on Saturday, Sunday, then what would your natural question be? Why? Well, then if that is the Sabbath, why are we going to church on? Sunday. Now, watch what they say. Answer. Let's read this now. Let's read together. Those who are going to read it. We observe Sunday instead of Saturday because the Bible. They don't even refer to the Bible. Because the Catholic Church in the Council of Laodicea, 8336, this is history, transferred the solemnity from Saturday to what? So what is that telling them? That the Catholic Church then assumes what? Power and authority even above God. Because if you can change God's holy law, then you have some power. You have some authority. Are you following? Yeah. The dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. This is the sign 
of his authority. The mark of the beast. Now watch. 1990, Catholic Press. Sunday is a Bible institution. Is a Catholic institution. And its claim to observance can be defended what? Do you know that a Catholic does not ever claim a true Catholic? Now you have some, you know, <laughs> tear Catholics, if you can call them that. But you have, every church has wheat and tear, some wide-eyed, you know, person. But you'll find out that, the, that, that, that a, a true understanding Catholic does not claim the Bible as his reason for going to church on Sunday. Now you can see when you don't have a real Catholic because he'll try, try to prove it from the Bible. But you say, you're not even a Catholic. Because the Catholic never does that. The Catholic actually believes that tradition is more important than Scripture. He doesn't even believe that. See, that's part of the principles. Catholicism principles is that tradition it has more weight than even the Bible itself. This is what Jesus was condemning. You, 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 with your tradition, you put it, make it none effect the commandments of God. Now, so it says, uh, uh, from beginning, he says, you can only defend it on Catholic principles. He knows that. From beginning to end of what? Scripture. He's giving you a BTI class. This is probably the best BTI class he gave you. So from beginning to end of Scripture, there is not a single passage that warns the transfer of weekly public worship from the last of the week, seven day Saturday, to the what? First Sunday. The Catholic Church, 1990 said, not hundreds of years ago, said that there's no scripture. So you know the question would be, well, why do we do it? Because we have the power. They, they don't even claim that it's the Bible. Look at this one. Chancellor of Cardinal Gibbons. Of course, the Catholic Church claims that the what? Saturday, Saturday, Sunday was her act, and the act is a mark. Look what he says. The mark of her ecclesiastical what? So he said, look, there was a, a, a book written called uh, Rome's Challenge in the 1890s. And this cardinal wrote it and said, I challenge any Protestant to tell me why you're going to church on Sunday. Because what he was trying to do was show that you really give authority to the Catholic Church when you worship on Sunday. Because it's not in the Bible. So they're saying, you know we're the mother church. We're the mother church. You are our daughter. And the way you know it is because when we tell you something to do, guess what? You obey. Most of the major religions know it. in Protestantism say it. They'll put it in their writings. We can't find anything in the Bible. They know it. They know it. And historically, not only do they know it, but they recognize her bowing. To the authority of Rome. Watch what it says. Catholic record from Ontario. It says. Sunday. Is what? Our, Our mark. Or. Authority. What is the issue? Authority. Did we see that from the Bible? Do you, are you understand? Just to see what a seal is. The church. Look at this. This is blasphemy. The church is above the Bible. They said, we don't need the BTI. The church is above the Bible. Now, guess what? You can't be a Christian church and say that. It's a tradition. That's it. We don't understand. Now, look at this. The church is above the Bible. Now, think about this. Christ, is not above, Christ said everything he did, it was what? It is written. What saith the scripture? How readest thou? A Christ-like person will follow what Jesus did then. Now, guess what? There are many in the Catholic Church who do not know what we're studying. Yeah. And I've met many of them. You know, I, I remember one time I was in one uh, uh, particular place. I remember what state was in. was in there, and a man stayed at the very end. He waited. People were asking questions at the very end for hours. He stayed about two hours after everyone else. And at the very end, he said, I want to talk to you. And he said, you don't know me, but I know who you are. I said, okay. He said, I've been watching you for a long time now on the internet and you finally came to where I am he said listen he said I am one of the sheep that you talked about that are not of this fold he said listen he said I was born and raised Catholic I never thought of anything but the Catholic Church but he said when I came to your Bible your studies and I read what you said I checked everything you said and I went back to my Bible and I saw it was there he said I recognized that everything I've been taught was a lie he said, I'm not yet baptized as a seven-day Adventist, but I believe it. 
And he said, I'm so glad that you taught that your church is in a war. He said, because I went to one of the first seven Adventist churches I can find. This is what the man said to me. He said, I went to one of the first seven Adventist churches. And he said, are you the church that knows Pastor Davis? Uh -oh. And they said, we don't, we don't recognize Pastor Davis. Oh, He's preaching heresy. Henry. The man went to another church. Henry. Is this church? And he said, but I was so glad that when I read your studies and listened and he said, you show that in the true church will be wheat and tares. Mm. There will be this opposing of the true message. And he said, I saw it for myself. Yes. He said, I'm getting ready to get baptized. I'm trying to bring my wife and children in. Please pray for me. Amen. Do you know that God has sheep all over the world? And, and, and the problem is not that the sheep are not ready. You know, the Catholic Church in the world, they're ready. The majority of true Christians in the, center, in the Catholic Church, but not in the Seventh Adventist Church. The majority of our churches are full of ministers and members that have no idea what is really happening. And in mercy, mercy, God is saying, please, I want to awaken us. He wants to help us. Do you see, my brothers and sisters? This says, Sunday is a mark of authority. The church is above the Bible. And this transference of Sabbath observance is what? Proof. Proof. Give me another name. Evidence. Evidence of that fact. He said, in other words, Sunday worship, the passing of a Sunday worship or an acting Sunday worship is evidence of that we have power authority, it is a mark or a seal by the very nature of what a mark or seal is when you study it. Are you following? Yeah. This is not something you just make up. Now, my brothers and sisters, this says no one has what? Yeah. Yet received the mark of the beast. So though Sunday is the mark of the beast, no one has the mark of the beast right now yet. See, just like just knowing the seven days of the Sabbath doesn't seal you, just going to church on Sunday doesn't give you the mark immediately. So we have to understand what transfers the seal from the signet to the document. What transfers the seal from the thing that does the sealing to the individual who's going to be sealed. You understand what I'm saying? Just having a stamp doesn't seal paper. Something has to happen before the seal is left on something else. So whether it's the seal of God or the mark of the beast. No one has yet received the mark of the beast. Why? The testing time has not yet so what tells me then what is going to cause the transfer to take place the testing time so before we can get either the seal of God or the mark of the beast there must come a what do you know that you will not get your certificate that you passed the class until you pass the test yes Come on, brother. And you don't get, I remember picking up a suit one time and I put, and put my hand in and there was a card in. Inspected. All the suits had to be inspected before you ever put it on. It has to pass inspection or investigation. There has to first be a judgment of the living. I mean, there has to be an investigation first. So first, there has to be a test, a final test. And then we either get the seal of God or the mark of God or the seal of Satan or the mark of of the beast. We can begin to see then there what the event is that brings the test. Okay, are you beginning to see it? Yes or no? Yes. It says the testing time is not yet come. Well, when does it come? There are true Christians where Every we day. talked about some of them not accepting the Roman Catholic communion. None are condemned until they have had the light and have seen the obligation of the what? But when, give me two words. What is the issue, brothers and sisters? The decree. We stated that one time before. Building the pomegranate, the decree. Remember that? Yes. The issue is the decree. Go to Esther. Let me show you something. Go to Esther 8. Esther 8. As we get ready to bring out some final points. Go to Esther 8. Esther, the eighth chapter. Isn't it wonderful you have to make nothing up? Amen. It's all in the Bible. Go to Esther chapter 8. And let's look what the Bible says in Esther chapter 8. Oh, man, this makes me want to study more and more. We've got to study like we never studied before. It's all throughout the Bible. Look at Esther chapter 8. I read a statement in volume 5 that says that we need to urge upon adults and children and families to study like you've never studied before. I promise you we need to do this. Amen. To pray like we never prayed before. We need to do this. We should be thankful that God has opened up this little church so we can do this together. Look what the Bible says in Esther 8. I want you to notice something now. Esther 8. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in verse 14. Esther 8 and verse 14. Now, let me ask you a question. I, if I had a seal like this, and I took a seal, and I took a document, and here's a seal, and I do like this. You're going to Esther 8 and hold your hand there. I'll show you the verse in a moment. 
And I do like this. Does it get sealed? No, no. What has to happen first? Now, in order to give a good seal, in order to get a good seal, I have to use what? Pressure. Now, follow this now. So, in order to get a seal, there has to be what? All the test is doing is applying what? Pressure. Pressure. Now, what is going to apply pressure? What is going to apply pressure to Sunday? What's going to apply pressure to Sunday? The decree. So in other words, sun worship, Sunday worship right now, it is the mark of the beast, just like this is, a, as it were, a stamp, but it's not, going to be, it's not going to mark anybody until pressure is put on it. So no one can get the mark of the beast until pressure is put on it. Are you following? Right. Now, let's see what pr produces pressure. Now, I'm reading this. I said, dear God, the Bible is so good. Look at this. Look how good this thing is. Mm, this thing is good. Now, look. Look. Esther 8. Look at verse, four, look, look at verse 14. Now, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I got to read this one. Too. This is so good. I got to read this one. Let, let's all read this again. Let's all, let's, all, let's all join in. Let's all join and read this. I'm saying so we can all. I won't be selfish. We all can read this one. <laughs> let's read verse 14. Let's read it. It says, so the post that rode upon mule and camels went out being hastened and pressed by on, why? By the king's commandment and the decree was given as Shushan. What pressed on? What pressed on this post? What pressed on this man with the message? What pressed him on? The decree. So my brothers and sisters, what is going to put pressure on, Sunday, on the Sunday law? What's going to put pressure on it? The decree. What decree? The national Sunday law decree is going to put pressure. The civil power of America, the civil authority of America is going to back Sunday worship by the highest court in this land, the Supreme Court. And when it becomes national, that will put the pressure on that will allow the ceiling to start. Does it make sense? Now, if we are sealed, what does the seal do? What does a seal do? What, what? Now, remember, perfect man. The seal comes when? At the end of something. Now, watch. Now, watch now. Go in your Bible to Job 41. Now, watch the Bible. Watch the Bible. I'm just reading this and saying, Lord, this is so good. I'm just text upon text. It's so beautiful. Look at Job 41. Watch what the Bible says in Job 41. What does a seal do? Watch now. Watch what the seal does, because once the pressure starts, it's going to do something to who it applies pressure to. Watch what it does. Job 41, Job 41, look at what the Bible says in verse 15. Job 41 and verse 15, watch what the, the seal does. Uh, Amaya, Job 41, verse 15. What does the Bible say in verse 15? 15, 15. Slow down now. What does a seal do? It shuts something up. That's why you put it on a letter or a document. It shuts something up or closes something. Like a stamp. Like a stamp. Yes. It sets something up. When you seal a paper, what do you do to the paper? When you're sealing it, you do what? Close it. You know, the Bible talks about the seven seals, remember? Of Revelation, the book and Revelation of seven seals. That's something that's closed. The seals being opened suggests that it was once what? Close. So what does the seal do? Closes it until it's open. So my brother and sister, what does a seal do? A seal closes something. So if we're seal, it's going to close something. Talk to me, somebody. Now watch now. Watch now. What, see, see, see if we can find out what it's doing. Now we see in Job 41 that it, go to Daniel 12. Go to Daniel 12. Go to Daniel 12. Daniel 12. A seal closes something. You're going to Daniel, the 12th chapter. Daniel 12. And Sister Chanel, if you'll read this, please. Daniel 12. Now, I want you to read verse 4 first. Daniel 12 and verse 4. Daniel 12 and verse 4. What does the Bible say in Daniel 12, verse 4, please? But thou, o Daniel, Slow down. Shut up the word and seal the book. So what does the sealing do? Shut something up. If you seal a book, you shut up a book. If you seal a person, you're shutting up something about a person. What do you mean shut up? What do you mean by shut up? Verse 9. Go to verse 9. Continue, sister. And he said, go thy way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the, end, the time of the end. 
So to shut something up is to do what? Close it. So a seal closes something shut. The door was shut. When the flood was getting ready to take place, the door was open, people would get on into the boat, right? But what happened when the door was shut? What happened? Probation closed. I wonder if the ceiling closes probation. I wonder if the ceiling shuts the door to an opportunity of salvation. Are you following me? It seals our eternal destiny. It closes our probation. I mean, my hair just stands up. The Bible is clear. How can you reject Bible? It's plain, brothers and sisters, what this issue of the Sunday law is all about. Now, as we go a little closer, as we get ready to close, watch what the Bible says as we go a little further. Go to Ephesians. Now, I want to ask another question. Watch this now. Look, at, look in your Bible now. When is the first time that we see the Sabbath? When is the first time? We're going to Ephesians 1. I'm not going to go through these texts. Now, in Genesis 2, is the first time we see the Sabbath mentioned in the Bible. It says, now this is my Bible. I blew it up on the screen, but I want you to see it, and I want you to be able to uh, see something. I don't know if your Bible has, but I'm going to do it so you can see it. But in Genesis 2, 1, your Bible has that. It says, thus the heavens and the earth were what? Amen. This is your Genesis 2, 1, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day, God ended his work. God did what? Amen. Now remember, you marked the perfect man when? When? At the end. So it says, God ended his work, which he had made, and rested on the day from all his work which he had made. So the Sabbath, he did not rest and have a Sabbath until his work was finished, done, or ended. All right? Now, then it says, and God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it the seventh day because that in it he had rested from all his work which God created and made. So the real sign that the Sabbath of is a sign first of God finishing a work. Now, it says, now watch how it puts it. Thus the heavens and the earth were what? Amen. Now do you notice that right there? That's like a little number there. I don't know if you can see it clearly, but you see a mark there. That mark, if you have a margin and you have a study Bible, that mark takes you to another place, normally the margin and minus the foot of the Bible, and it gives you the Hebrew word, the original word used, translated finish. The Hebrew word is not actually the word finish. There's another word, but it does finish something. It's at the end of something. Now, do you have a study Bible where you have a margin in your Bible? If you do not, I'll show you my Bible. But if you do, if you, do you can look at it on yours. But in mine, notice it puts a number there, and I follow the, to the bottom of the Bible to find out what it means in Hebrew. I go up here, here's the word finish. Let's see if I can blow it up. Now, here is the bottom of my Bible, and it takes me to that number one, which that word was in Genesis 2, and the Hebrew word for finish, guess what the Hebrew word is? Uh-uh, that's not what the Hebrew word is. Brought to perfection. So when the Bible says the heavens and the earth were finished in the Hebrew, that's not what it says. In the Hebrew, what it says, thus the heavens and the earth were brought to perfection. Which means he finished it. He completed his work. Are you following? So now my brothers and sisters, then that is the Sabbath is a seal of what he's going to do to a person. The person, the Sabbath, is the sign of an experience of one who has been brought back to perfection like he did to the earth. Amen. And just knowing the seven days of the Sabbath does not bring me to perfection. While well, I'm still fighting and fussing and killing and, and eating whatever I want and talking what I want, watching what I want, doing what I want. If there's still animosity and selfishness, this cannot receive the seal. There has to be a complete transformation. Do you know that no lazy person can get a seal? Do you know all of this God is trying to prepare us for? That is the sign. Now, question now. So then, this, watch now. To restore a man. Remember this quotation? To restore a man, the image of his maker, to bring him what? Back to the perfection in which he was. This was to be the work of The work of redemption is to bought us and bring us back to per. That's what the priest is doing in the sanctuary right now. And if he finishes his work in us, seal placed upon us. That says genuinely, there's evidence that this person is my child. They love me. They keep my commandments. They've been tested, even to the point of death. Now, my brothers and sisters, that means that the seal 
is a sign of a what? Completed work. A person brought back to per. But guess what? The Sunday Sabbath is also a seal. Now, what day of the week? Why, why is the seven day? Do you know that the only day that could have symbolized brought to an end or perfection is the seven day? Why? That's the only day that's at the end. Do you know? I, see, I'm not just speaking numeric, numerically. I'm saying it's no way to symbolize brought to perfection unless you go to the seven. You can't change that. It's impossible if you know that's the work. Now, on Sunday, then what is Sunday Sabbath a symbol of? The only thing it could be. Now think about it now. That's, it's chaos started. Missing the beginning. That's good. That's good. That's good. But I want to go, go. Let's go a little bit more. Now watch now. Did God? Did God do something? Did God do something on the first day? Yes, yes. yes He did. You go to Genesis one. He said, "Let there be light," and there was. Light. So did He begin order, ordering somebody? Yes. So Sunday worship is the symbol of a Christian experience that was started but never brought to perfection. You know, an atheist can never receive the mark of the beast. Did you know that? An atheist cannot receive the mark of the beast. You know why? God didn't start the work inside of him. So someone says, what do you mean? We're going to find out that in the last days there will be no more atheists. Do you understand, brothers and sisters, in the final generation, do you know atheists and the king, you're going to find out that whole system of atheism is getting ready to be destroyed. No more. When the sun law is passed and it becomes worldwide, you either <laughs> are going to either become a Christian, profess it, or you won't be. It's going to pressure even the atheists to accept a form of godliness with no power. My brothers and sisters, what you want to find out, the whole world is going to be divided into two clans. It's not going to be Baptist and Pentecostal and Presbyterian. It's only going to be a true believer of God or a not believer in God. True church, false church. Seal of God, mark of the beast. Wheat, tear, sheep, goat. Light, darkness. Now, my brothers and my sisters, this Sunday Sabbath is a symbol of an incomplete work. Someone who has started the Christian religion, but has never been brought to what? Can a seven-day Adventist receive the mark of the beast? He's a perfect candidate. You know why? Because if he accepts Jesus, the work has started. A Baptist accepted Jesus. A Pentecostal who has accepted Jesus, a Catholic who has accepted Jesus, but have not followed on to know the Lord, God can't place his seal upon them if they're not willing to allow God to bring them all the way back into a relationship with himself. But that's true with us as Seventh-day Adventists. Have you been brought back to perfection? If we're honest, <laughs> all we've got to be extremely honest. I don't know about you, I have not been brought back to perfection. You know what that means? If the Son of Law were to pass right now, you could not receive the seal of God. He can only mark the perfect man. You know what we would have to get right now? Even though we came to church today, you know what we would have to get? The mark of the beast. That's solemn. We've gone to church. We've been pastors, evangelists, elders. Coming to church and still as children and adults receiving the mark of the beast. And our children can get it. Our families. Do you see why this is serious? Yes or no? Yes. Just knowing the seven days of Sabbath is, doesn't mean that that's enough. Do you see what the shaking is all about now? He's got to shake out everything that's not real. Now look. Let's read it together now. Now we're going to read it together. I dot, dot, dot the first time. But we're going to read it. Marinatha 200 as we get ready to close. It says, just as what? Soon as the people of God are. Not as soon as they know what the seal is. That's not what it says. As soon as they are what? Sealed in their foreheads. It is not any seal or mark that can be. But a settling. I'm going to stop. I'm going to come back. The sealing is a what? Settling. What do you mean? Go to 1 Peter. Let me show you from the Bible. Let me go to show you from the Bible first. Go to 1 Peter chapter 5. Go to 1 Peter 5. I want to see this very simply. This has to happen before the pressure. We're going to find out that inspiration speaks of the sealing in two ways. Inspiration speaks of the sealing how? Two ways. You're going to find that the inspiration speaks of the sealing sometimes talking about the process. Sometimes talking about after the test. Where the people have been sealed because they've been tested. 
Now, the process we're going to find out is the work of preparation. It's the preparing for the seal, the pre preparation for the seal. We're going to find out what that is. Now, in 1 Peter chapter 5, look what the Bible says in 1 Peter 5. 1 Peter 5. But after the test, the test comes by the pressure. What brings the pressure again? What brings the pressure? The decree. The decree. What is really the decree? The national Sunday law. So there is a part of the sealing that happens before the Sunday law. What happens before the Sunday law? What sealing happens before the Sunday law? The preparation. The what? Preparation. We have to be brought back to a prepared place before the Sunday law in order to be sealed when the Sunday law takes place. Now you're going to find out something very carefully. Look at 1 Peter. I'll explain it as we go to the text. 1 Peter 5. Look at 1 Peter 5. And look at what it says in verse uh, 10. 1 Peter 5 verse 10. Uh, Elder Smokey, would you read that for us, please? First Peter 5, verse 10. What did it say there, please? But the God of all grace, who hath called us unto his eternal glory by Jesus Christ, after that ye have suffered a while. Now, slow down. Make you perfect. So what is God trying to do? Make us what? Perfect. Now, once he makes us perfect, that's the preparation. Watch now. Once he makes us perfect, in a sense, we have the sealing preparation. Are you following me? So the sealing preparation is that we're brought back to perfection. Now, we're not sealed yet because the pressure has not been applied, but we have the preparation for the seal. Now, watch what the Bible says. Once you've been perfect, though, something else must happen. Make you perfect. What else? Establish, strengthen, so after we've been made perfect, God must do a second part. He must do what? Settle us. He must do what? Settle. Settle. What, is, what does that mean? Settle. See, there's something connection with perfection. With perfection, there has to be the connection that's settling. There's what? Settling. Now, let me ask you, what, what does settle mean? Now, go in your Bible. Go in your Bible to uh, Colossians 1. Go in your Bible to Colossians 1, but tell me, what, what is settling? We're going to Colossians 1. What is settling? What is settling? You want to move? All right. Now, that's, that's exactly right. But I, I'm, I'm trying to think. I, I like to think from a literal way first when you, you, you're naturally thinking, okay, here's water, and you have sand in the water. If you stir up the sand, it's all in the water, shaking around. But if you let the, the water sit, what happens after a while? The sand does the what? It begins to what? Settle to the bottom. In other words, what do you mean that it's settling? It's going to its place so that it cannot be moved. So you can begin to see the settling process is moving through the water, moving through the water, moving through the water. And finally, it stops moving. You say now it's what? Settle. Are you following me? Now, look at Colossians 1. Look at Colossians 1. Colossians 1. Look what the Bible says in verse 23. So the perfect perfection process is finished by being settled. By being what? Settled. Let's see what that means. Colossians 1, verse 23. Amaya, verse 23, please. If ye continue in the faith, grounded, and settled. what for? So, just like our sister said, when you get settled, what happens to us? We can no longer be what? We can no longer be what? Moved. Now, is simply brought back to perfection mean you're settled? Does simply being brought back to perfection mean that you're settled? I see you're not sure. Was Adam perfect? Was he settled? How do we know? He was moved. So when we reach the condition of sinlessness in which Adam lived before his transgression, that's the preparation for the seal, but that's not yet settling. So there is a work to be brought back to perfection, but then we must be settled in that perfection so that we won't lose that perfection anymore. Adam never had it. Lucifer never had it. But the final generation will get it. So that nothing can move us from this perfection. This is the sealing. This is what the seal is to do. To settle us so that we can't move. And the only thing you can do to us is to kill us. Now look what the Bible says, brothers and sisters, so we cannot be moved. Go to 1 Kings 8. 1 Kings 8. Go to 1 Kings 8. And look at how long this settling process is to be. Perfection, we must be settled. Once we're settled, how long is the settling to last? This perfected settling. Go to 1 Kings 8. And notice what the Bible says in 1 Kings 8 
And, Sister Davis, if you'll read for us verse 13. 1 Kings 8 and verse 13. And notice now what this is doing, this settling, what this is settling is for. 1 Kings 8 and verse 13. What does the Bible say in verse 13? What type of house? Continue. Now, do you remember they had a sanctuary in the wilderness that they could move from place to place? It was a movable sanctuary. They could move it all throughout the wilderness for 40 years. But then the Bible says, ah, I want a house that's permanent, a house that cannot be moved. And so it says, I'm going to have a set up place for thee to what? So the true settling is where you cannot be moved. How long? Forever. Forever. This closes our probation, either for good or for bad. Do you see? Yes or no? That's what it is. Now, my brothers and sisters, look at the quotation again now. It says, just as soon as the people of God are sealed in their foreheads, it is not any seal or mark that can be, but a settling into the truth, both intellectually and spiritually, so they cannot be moved. Then we prove that from the Bible. Yes. Just as soon as God's people are sealed like that. And are what? Prepare. For the Shaking. It will come. Soon as we get into a position where nobody can be moved. That are a part of the true children of God. Then Sunday law comes on the scene. This is what we should be praying for. Do you see it brothers and sisters? Yes. God has promised that where shepherds are not true, he will take charge of the flock. Even if there were no faithful minister or pastor or preacher, God will take control. God has never made the flock wholly dependent upon human instrumentalities. But the days of what? Purification. Shaking. Of the church are hastening apace. God will have a people what? Pure and true in the mighty what? Now, what is the shaking for? Talk to me somebody now. What is the shaking for? To see those people who can be moved. So those who can remain may remain. Now, if I move, what is it evidence of? I'm not settled. If I'm shaking out, it's an evidence that I have not been what? Settled. And if I'm not settled, I haven't been sealed. Either intellectually or spiritually. You shouldn't be able to move me from scripture, nor should you be able to move me in my life. It says, but the days of purification and church hasten the pace. God will soon have a people pure and true and the mighty sifting soon to take place. We shall better be able to measure the strength of Israel. The signs reveal that the time is what? When the Lord will manifest that his fan is in his hand and he will what? Thoroughly purge his floor. How do we know that? Do you know that the sealing will take place after the limit is reached? Is that limit almost reached? It is. Look what it says. We're getting ready to close. We'll pass on that right now. Now, I want to ask you a question. What angel does this? What angel does this? Let's see what angel does this. Ah, I, I, hear, I hear this. Earl of the Writings 118. I then saw the third, third angel. What, what is the angel warned against? Revelation 14, 9. If any man worship the beast, his image, his... It's talking about the seal of the mark. It says, I then saw the third angel. Said mighty common angel, fearful is what? Whose work? The third angel. All for is what? His mission. Whose mission? The third angel. He is the angel. Listen to this, brothers and sisters. That is to what? Select the wheat from the test and seal or bind the wheat for the heavenly garden. These things should engross the whole mind, the whole attention. Nothing else should get our attention but what we're studying right now. Because this is the issue. If we get this sealing or binding, we're safe. If we don't, we're lost. It starts off by understanding the seven is a Sabbath. But when you study the Sabbath, you're going to find out intellectually, that means it's a sign of someone brought back to perfection, but I'm not yet brought back to perfection. That means I can only receive the mark of the beast. Lord, I need a deeper what? Experience. This is what the Day of Atonement is all about. That's when our destiny is sealed. This is when the church militant becomes the church triumphant. Once it becomes whole wheat. That's what this is all about. I'm a pastor right now. We'll come back to this another time and look at that. We see that when that testing time comes, what happens now? A body is what? Prepared. Now, I want to ask you one more question as we get ready to close. Do you want to be sealed? Yes. Do we need the seal? Yes. Do we see what the seal is? Yes. Is it simple? Yes. Is it clear? Yes. Now, who seals us? Can we seal ourselves? No. 
who seals us? Because remember now, we see now there's a relationship between the sealing and the shaking. Can we see that? But that's not the sermon's title. The sealing, the shaking, and the... We're closing here. Now, my brothers and my sisters, who seals us? Now, remember in Ezekiel 9, there's something happening in Ezekiel 9? Now, go to, go to 2 Corinthians 1 for a moment. Go to 2 Corinthians 1. Go to 2 Corinthians 1. 2 Corinthians 1, we need to know now. We know what the seal is. We see it. It's the Sabbath. It's a sign of his power of authority to create and bring something to perfection. We cannot be sealed unless we've been brought to perfection. It's a sign of that experience. And now we see that the only one that can do that is the priest, Jesus God. Look at 2 Corinthians 1, and we'll see that the sealing is not the work that man can do for himself. We can't mark ourselves. 2 Corinthians 1, look what the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 21. 2 Corinthians 1, and we'll start in verse 21. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? Now, now he would establish you, us, with you in Christ, and have anointed us, he is what? God. Verse 22. Who have also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Who seals us? Uh, that's not what the text says. The Bible says, look at verse 21. It's talking about somebody. Now he which established us with you in Christ and have anointed us is who? God. Who have also sealed us? Who has sealed us? God. So God is the one that seals us. Are you following me? It is not the work of man. You cannot seal yourself. I can't seal myself. It's the work of God. If I don't go to God and have a relationship with God, I can't be sealed. So what if I'm spending all my time in television and the world and no time with God? No seal. What if all my children's time is spent and just doing everything common, but nothing with God? No seal. I'm preparing them for the mark of the beast. But now, God does the sealing, but what does God use? Now remember in Ezekiel 9, the writer has a what? Ink horn. So what seals us is what? Ink. <laughs> what seals us is what? That's in Ezekiel 9. That's the chapter on the seal. Ink seals us. He is the writer's ink horn to ink us. That's where the sealing comes from. But now, what is the ink? Go to 2 Corinthians 3. Go to 2 Corinthians 3. What is the ink? Go to 2 Corinthians 3. Look at verse 2. You remember the apostle said you are living epistles. Remember that? We are living books. God is writing on us. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 2. Let's read that together. What does the Bible say? Ye are our what? What is epistle? An epistle is a letter. Written in our what? Hearts. Known and read of what? Look at verse 3. This is a good one. Verse 3 says, For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but how? How are you written? What's the real ink? With the Spirit of the living God. So what does this ink represent? Talk to me, somebody. The Holy Spirit of God. So my brothers and sisters, what does God give us to seal us? The rain. The rain. The rain seals us. The rain settles us. The rain. What does he give us? The rain. Now notice I didn't say early or latter. I said what? Because the rain includes what? Now, what we're going to see, brothers and sisters, is that we need both of these rains to be sealed. Look what the Bible says in Ephesians 1. You're in Corinthians. Go to Galatians. Ephesians chapter 1. God seals us, but notice how he seals us. In Ephesians, the first chapter. Sister Debbie, if you read this for us, please. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Ephesians 1, verse 13. The Bible in Ephesians 1 tells us how he seals us. Ephesians 1 and verse 13. What does the Bible say in verse 13? Talk to me. Now listen to him now. How were you sealed? What sealed them? Talk to him. What sealed them? So do you want the seal? Who does the sealing? God. What does God give to seal us? So then how do I receive the seal? By receiving the Holy Spirit represented by the early and the latter rain. Now I want to show you something. You want to find out 
that the early rain starts the sealing. Where does God start bringing us back to perfection? Where does he begin the work of bringing us to perfection? In the holy place. Do you know that the early rain comes from the holy place that starts the sealing? The apostles were talking to people in the early rain, under the early rain, telling them, when you receive the early rain, you receive the sealing. It was the beginning of a sealing process, bringing them back to what? Perfection. But did it finish in the holy place? It went on to the most holy place. He's going to finish the work of uh, uh, bringing us back to perfection inside the most holy place. Now, what comes out of the most holy place? Early rain? What is the room of the, holy, uh, the most holy place for? The latter rain. That finishes the work of the sealing. Go to Ephesians 4. Just showing us now the agency of the seal. Ephesians 4. Look at verse 30. Would you read this for us, Sister Shirley, please? Ephesians 4 and verse 30. What does the Bible say in Ephesians 4 verse 30? Ephesians, the fourth chapter and the 30th verse, and notice the agency, what God used to seal us. Verse 30. Why? So who seals us? The Holy Spirit. Now notice, until the day of? So then, when the seal is put upon us, it closes the work of? Redemption. He's sealing us until the day of redemption. It closes the work. It shuts the work. It closes the door of redemption. And if we're in the right position, that's for good. In the wrong position, it's for bad. So now, my brothers and sisters, that tells me then that I need the rain if I'm going to be sealed. That's who does the sealing, the Holy Spirit. So is there a relationship between the sealing, the shaking, and the rain? Yes or no? The early rain starts the sealing work, but the latter rain, guess what it does? What does the latter rain do? It finishes the work of sealing. So then if I receive the early rain, the sealing starts, but I don't receive the latter rain, then what does that tell me? The work has never been brought to, and there's only one sign that you can wear. What is the only sign to wear? The sign of an incomplete experience. And that's the sign of what? The mark of the beast. So my brothers and sisters, it's not enough to start. It's a dangerous thing to start and not finish. God is trying to prepare us for this latter rain. So then what does our study need to be from this point on? What does our study need to be? How? How? Because if I get the rain, I get the seal. Amen. If I get the early rain, I get the start of the seal. If I get the latter rain, I finish the sealing and nothing can move me. Amen. I want this. Yes. Now we can't study it this time. Next time we come, uh, we'll pick up next week and we'll find out actually how to receive that rain. Uh, we'll find out how to receive that rain. Let me bring it to a close now. Now watch what this says. What are you doing, brethren, in the great work of what? Preparation. Those who are uniting with the world are receiving the worldly. What does the mold mean? Talking about little green stuff growing on your bread? What is a mold? Now, what do you normally think about when you hear mold? A wax seal. You have a mold? I remember th this week I was studying about a wax seal, and I just just trying to understand how the, how the literal, natural sealing works. And I'd studied before. I want to study more in depth. And as I was looking, I said, man, this is so interesting. You know, you have to heat it up. Do you know what heats us up? The fiery trials. Hmm. Test. Temptation. That's to warm us up, to get us ready. But sometimes we don't like the trials. It's necessary to be sealed. It's important. It says, those who are uniting with the world... What if I like worldly music and worldly diet and worldly dress and worldly fun and worldly activities? Then I'm receiving the what? And I am preparing, but I'm preparing for the mark of the beast. What mode are we giving to our families? Those who are distrustful of what? Self. Who are humbling themselves before God and purifying their souls. How? By obeying the truth. These are receiving the... And are preparing for the seal of God in their foreheads. Well, when do we get, we, we're, we have the mold right now, but when does the actual stamp get put upon us? When? And the stamp is? Did we find that from the Bible? Their character will remain pure and spotless how long? 
Now, I want you to understand, if you get the seal, you cannot change it. Volume 5, 5T216. Now, if you get the seal, guess what? You can't change it. Go to Esther as we close. Go to Esther. Go to Esther, chapter 8. Go to Esther, chapter 8. And look what the Bible says in Esther 8. Esther, the eighth chapter. You know, as we talk about this, and that tells me something now. If the decree brings us... Now, who's going to be pressured when the national sin law is passed? Is the Baptist going to be pressured first? No. Why is the Baptist not going to be pressured when the sin law is passed? He believes Sunday is the, is the Sabbath. He's not being pressured. Episcopalian? Methodist? Catholic? Who is the only one that is going to be pressured? Those who understand the true issue of the seven-day Sabbath. That means that the stamping doesn't start on them when they don't understand the issue. Judgment must begin at the house of God because that's when the pressure starts. Does it make sense now? Yeah. It's not just words. You could understand, ah, the stamping has to press, but I'm not being pressed if I don't see an issue. But the seventh Adventist who understands what they, and he goes to church and worship and, and still goes out and eats and, and, and does whatever he wants to do because he wants to have his own abilities. He's going to receive the mark of the beast. God is trying to tell us from right now the pressure. Now, my brothers and my sisters, you're going to Esther chapter 8. Somebody has said before to me, they say, you know what? How do you know then that a person can't just say, well, I'm going to do right when the sin laws pass and do right, and then all of a sudden they're going to start doing wrong after that? <laughs> You know you can't get the mark of the beast just so you can eat a little bit and then say, you know what, I want to wash it off and then get a seal. If you get the mark of the beast, guess what happens? It's over. Now look at what the Bible says. Look at the nature of a seal. I want you to see the nature of a seal. Esther 8, look what the Bible says. Let's read this together. Esther 8, verse 8. Watch the nature of the seal. Verse 8, 8, 8. What does it say? It says, write ye also for the Jews as it like of you in the king's what? Name. And seal it with the king's what? Ring. For the writing which is written in the king's name. I can't hear you. And sealed with the king's ring. May no man. What? So a seal is irreversible. It's an eternal decision. Does it make sense? Yes or no? So now brothers and sisters. Do you want the seal? Yes. Then we have to say, Lord, how do I get this rain? We're going to study that next week, Lord willing. Let's go to 2 Timothy as we close, our final text. 2 Timothy chapter 2. We started with it. We want to finish with it. 2 Timothy 2. Now, do we have much time? Yes or no? no. We see the shaking is coming to the church. We see that God has to point out some sins. We will talk about this more to understand how, when we see how to get the seal. But I want you to see something. You're going... 2 Timothy 2. Now, look what this says. You're going to 2 Timothy 2. We're going to close there. 2 Timothy 2. This is volume 5, 207. I would encourage anyone, if you have not read the chapter in volume 5, there's a whole chapter called The Seal of God. It starts on 207. This is taken from my wife, my daughter and I was reading this in our family. We've been reading it and I was reading this and I was saying, Lord, this is so serious. I, I, I finished it again this morning. I said, Lord, this is so serious. Let's read what this says. Now watch, we're closing. Jesus is what? The mercy seat of the. Now stop. Now what does that tell me? I can't really understand the seal unless I understand the sanctuary. Yes. What's this doing in the chapter on the, on the seal of God? It starts off by saying uh, later on, Jesus is about to leave the mercy seat. So the sealing has to, something to do with Jesus leaving the mercy seat. The close of what? That's what the sealing does. Mercy of the heavenly sanctuary to put on garments of vengeance and pour out his wrath and judgments upon those who have not responded to the light God has given them because what? Sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily. Therefore, the hearts of the Son of Man is fully set in them to do, do evil. Instead of being softened by the patience and long forbearance that the Lord has exercised toward them, those who fear not God and love not the truth, strengthen their hearts in their what? You know, because God has waited so long and mercy has given us in 2021, some people say, well, then God's going to continue to wait. But there are what? Limits, Limits even to the forbearance of God. Therefore, God must interfere and vindicate his what? Honor. Now, do you understand, brother and sister, the ceiling comes to say that the limit has been reached. Now, this is the same chapter, next paragraph. After talking about the limits, watch what it says. Of the Amorites, the Lord said, in the fourth generation, they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet what? Although this nation was conspicuous because of its idolatry and corruption, it had not yet filled its 
cup of his iniquity, iniquity and God would not give command for its what? Now remember Ezekiel 8 and 9? The Ezekiel 9, those angels, when they came with the ceiling, they came with slaughter weapons to destroy. Now, here's a symbol of this. The people were to see the divine power manifested in a marked manner that they might not be left without excuse. The compassionate creator was willing to bear with their iniquity until the... Then, if no change was seen for the better, his judgments were to fall upon them. I wonder if we're in the fourth generation. I wonder if 2024 has anything to do with the fourth generation. My brothers and sisters, we have no idea how close we are to the limit. But we're not ready. Our family, our children, our homes, our church. And if we're not ready, how can the world be ready? My brothers and my sisters, I pray this morning that our mind will start saying, Lord, in 1844, the generation started. He went into the most holy place. The sealing work started in 1844. That was the beginning of the third angel's message. That was the rise of the message. But it's to progress and swell and to allow cry. So in 1844, the sealing work begins where God trying to finish the work of bringing us to perfection. Now, my brothers and my sisters, as this sealing work begins, he starts 1844. The time of the footman. But guess what? 40 years, a generation. We're getting ready to see that the limits of the fourth generation are about to be reached in a few short years at the most. And if there's no change for the better, destruction. Question, you think we changed for the better? There has been a change but not for the better. Our church has gotten worse than from where we started. But I praise God that there's a redemption plan. What do you say? Amen. I want God to start with me in my house. What do you say? Amen. In conclusion, in conclusion, we'll pick up next week. Homework, please. If you get a chance, read the seal of God. If you don't, at least, there's not the mo at most, at least, please, your, your pamphlet on the shaking. It deals with the shaking, the sealing, and the latter rain and the early rain. It, read it. You'll see how it fits together. Very powerful. And we want to be prepared to discuss when we come back next week. Please, let's conclude in 2 Timothy 2 and verse 19. 2 Timothy 2 verse 19. Let us read this together. What does the Bible say in verse 19? All together. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having what? This seal. The Lord knoweth. If I'm going to get the seal, I've got to know him. I've got to know him. If I'm going to get the rain, I've got to know him. That's the, the context is always in, do we know God? And everyone that names his name, what does the text say? We need to what? Depart, verse 19. We need to depart from iniquity. If I didn't depart from iniquity, do I know God? Let me ask you. We're closing. As my custom is, I'm darkening the screen so we're not tempted to go for it. Now I want to ask you a question. Have you been brought to perfection? Do you think there's some things in your life that need to come out? Yes. So then if we're awake and, and, and the time is running out, if the time is, is running out right now, and we don't know how much time we have, what should we be doing right now? What should we be doing right now? We, we should be awake. But if we haven't woke up, wake up. What are we doing right now? If we stay with God, he wished we would be clean right now. But guess what? He's still cleaning. So we're on step with him. We're cleaning. We're on step with him. Because what is he doing in 1844? He entered the most holy place to cleanse the sanctuary. We're going to find out there's a direct relationship between receiving the rain and the cleansing of the sanctuary. We're going to study that next week. But now my brothers and sisters... I want to know how I can get into this position. Don't you want to know how? Yes. This is what we need to get into. We see its importance. We see what's happening. We see the time is short. Now we need to know how. This week, I want to encourage you. If you start reading that little path, you're going, to see, you're going to begin to see how. Talk to God. Lord, what's in my heart that needs to come out? 
so that I can get to know you as a close and intimate and personal friend. Do you want to know God? If you know him, you will receive the seal. If we have the seal, we'll be protected. And if we're protected, we can be a part of the team that God uses to finish the work. I want to be a part of the team. What do you say? Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, the Bible is clear. We see that there is a relationship between the sealing, the shaking, and the rain. The early rain starts this sealing process. It causes us to swell until it produces a shaking. And then, dear God, those who pass that test will be pressured and receive the seal of the living God and will receive the latter rain that will be used to empower us to give the loud cry and to finish the work. But, Lord, we will never Get this seal without victory over sin. Departing from iniquity. And we will never depart unless we have you and your power. And so, Father, I ask you, please help us to pray like never before for grace and power. Help us to pray, Lord, that you will give us more years, more time so that we can get ready and our families ready. And to help others, Lord, that are not here. Lord, please settle us so that we cannot be moved. Thank you for the seven-day Sabbath, your seal, which is a sign of this experience. But help us to know it's not enough just to come to church on Sabbath. We have to be brought to perfection, to a place where we know you that is demonstrated in victory over every sin, private and secret. Cleanse us by your blood. Save us. I pause the prayer. If someone here says, Lord, I want your power. I need your reign. I need your Holy Spirit. I need your help. Seal me, dear God. Prepare me, settle me. You want God to help you, just raise your hand. Heavenly Father, you see the lifted hand, I'm lifting mine. Save us, we pray. We thank you for what you have done today. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.